My hope is that the coming chapters will help you dive deeper into the realm of infinite possibilities for a divinely guided life. Chapter 5. The universe works fast when you're having fun. In 2014, my husband and I spent nine months hunting for a new apartment. We live in New York City, which is a competitive market that can make renting or buying real estate challenging. In addition, our search happened to coincide with one of the best sellers markets in recent history. Consequently, each new viewing would leave us more and more depressed. Our reaction to everything was, ugh, another overpriced, craptastic listing. We quickly lost sight of the joy that comes with buying your first home. Instead, we started to feel terrible because we were getting priced out of neighborhoods we didn't even want to live in. The whole experience was bringing us down. In time, we started to get sick, fight, and lose faith in our dream home. Then one night, after spending three hours in Brooklyn touring overpriced apartments, all in need of gut renovations, we both unraveled. My husband was angry and reciting his mantra, This is unfun. This is unfun. I was getting frustrated because we'd spent so much time and energy trying to find something that didn't seem to exist. Then, in the midst of a mini meltdown, I said the magic words to my husband, There has to be a better way. Let's pray for a creative solution. He nodded yes, and we prayed. I said, thank you, universe, for opening us up to creative possibilities. We surrender our plans to you. Show us what you've got. Within seconds, we both felt lighter. A smile came over me as I settled into the feeling of surrender. And my husband was now smiling, too. He was thrilled that we'd finally released our need to control. In our surrender, we realigned with the true source of power, the universe. In that surrender, an inspire idea came forth. I said to my husband, Honey, you know how we always dreamed of living in the country? Why don't we reverse our search and check out some houses upstate? He looked at me with excitement and said, That sounds fun. We were back in action. 45 minutes later, my husband had found four listings in the country. Within 24 hours, we connected to a real estate agent and set up a tour for all four houses, including a really awesome one on a mountain. That Sunday, we headed north. Universal Lesson the universe works fast when you're having fun. The first house we visited was the mountain house. As we approached it, my husband said, This is the one. I can feel it. We pulled into a magical driveway hundreds of yards long that wound its way up to a steep path cut through the woods. The drive emptied into a charming world of English gardens and stone walls. Here and there, marble objects and unusual plantings joyfully played with the beauty of the natural landscaping. Surrounding the front of the house were trees displaying every color of foliage, and the centerpiece of the living room was a view that stretched for miles. Seeing this for the first time was at once exciting and calming. The moment we walked into the house, I felt a rush of loving energy move through my body. I said to my husband and the agent, This makes no sense, but I feel at home. We went on to look at a few more houses, but none of them seemed to make us feel as good as the mountain house did. Over the next few weeks, we visited the mountain house several more times to get additional information about the property. On our fourth visit, we invited our parents along to get their opinions. The day before our parents' visit, I was on the phone with my dear friend Colette Baron reed who happens to be a powerful psychic medium. I was telling Colette all about the mountain house. I shared my excitement and my uncertainty. She said, have you asked for a sign? I replied, a sign? What's that? She went on to explain that whenever she comes into a new home, she asks for a sign. She went on to explain that whenever she moves into a new home, she asks for a sign. Her sign is a dragonfly. She said that when she found her last home, she knew it was hers when she saw a book in the house with a dragonfly on the cover. I loved the idea of asking for a sign. I said, Colette, I really dig the dragonfly, but my sign will be an owl. I have no idea why I chose the owl. Maybe the owl chose me. So we set off to visit the house with our parents. The moment we arrived, I noticed a gift card on the kitchen table with a dragonfly on it. I took that as a preliminary sign. Though I'd found Colette's dragonfly, I was still committed to finding my owl. So I scoured the house, searching for the owl. I was looking for the owl everywhere, on books, in the trees, even on the dishware. By the time we were ready to leave the house, I still hadn't found my owl. I texted Colette and said, I didn't find my owl, but I found your dragonfly. She replied, great. We were talking about the dragonfly, so that's enough. Colette's reply calmed me down, and we got in the car to head home. 
Before we got on the highway, my husband and I stopped in town for a coffee. When we were walking back to our car, I turned to the left and glanced at the bumper of the car next to ours. On the bumper was a sticker of a massive flying owl. I screamed, I found our owl! It was a big sign that the universe had our back. A few weeks later, we made an offer on the house and it was accepted instantly. As excited as we were, we were also very nervous. Because this was our first home purchase, we were both wary of getting too excited before the paperwork was signed. In the process of negotiating the final terms on the contract, we traveled to London because I had several speaking engagements. While I was in London, my fear began to creep up on me. Rather than let fear and uncertainty get the best of me, I chose to pray about it. I had an intimate conversation with the universe. I said, thank you for showing me once again that I am on the right path. Universe, I think I need more owls. When you're in alignment with the highest good, the universe works fast. Within an hour of saying this prayer, I started to see owls everywhere. There were graffiti street art owls, owl pillows in store windows, owls on clothing, owls all over London. Later that night, I had a speaking engagement at a beautiful church in London called the St. James Cathedral. The lovely sound man at the church always gives the speakers a postcard adorned with one of his favorite paintings. In the past, he's given me a painting of a bear. This night, he showed up with two paintings. He said, I knew your husband was coming, so I brought you both a piece of my art. He handed the first painting, a bear, to my husband. Then he said, I'm not sure why, but I had a feeling this one was for you. Then he handed me a painting of an owl. In this moment, I sighed with relief, knowing that the universe truly had my back. I thanked him for the gift and thanked the universe for the sign. Two weeks later, my husband and I closed on our mountain house. The moment we were willing to shift our internal projections, we shifted our perceptions. When we turned to prayer and inner guidance, we were led to creative possibilities. Universal lesson. Limitless guidance is available to you when you surrender to receive it. Logic, fear, and limitation cut off our connection to creative possibilities and universal guidance. Once we surrendered to our true power, miracles began pouring in, and fast. Through the process of remembering and accepting our energetic power, we were able to regain faith and get excited. The universe is an abundant flow of positive, powerful energy. When you align with that loving, powerful force of energy, you become a magnet for more of it. When you get psyched about something and lead from a place of joy, immediately the universe starts to show you the way. You have the power to align with whatever it is you want to see. This alignment will always be positive and supported to your life as long as you're in tune with your energetic power. In the case of the apartment hunt, my husband and I had gotten so involved in the stories of the overpriced, craptastic real estate market that we'd completely forgotten about our energetic power. In fact, we diminished it with every negative thought, feeling, and comment. The story we built up is what brought us down. The good news is that we can choose to perceive it differently. By simply opening up to creative possibilities and surrendering, we allowed the universe to do her thing. Within one short conversation, we were able to come back to our true power, release our fear story, and reconnect with inspiration and love. Universal Lesson Reconnecting with your power begins by realizing that you lost it. Here are the steps we took to reconnect with the universe. Use these steps to remind yourself of the powerful connection you can tap into at any given time. Step one, be determined to see with love. What are you saying, out loud or to yourself, that's disconnecting you from your power? For instance, do you often complain to your friends about how difficult it is to find a romantic partner and how hard it is to date at your age? Or do you get home every day only to vent about how much you hate your boss or your job, wishing you could leave but telling yourself the market's too tough to make a move? Get honest with yourself. Once you've identified your low vibe story, take a moment to get real with yourself about how it makes you feel. In my husband's and my case, our low vibe real estate story was literally making us sick. We were so depressed and anxious that we started to fight and argue for no reason. Take a moment to recognize the way your words and beliefs are blocking the support of the universe. What is the number one low vibe story that you have on repeat and how does it make you feel? Write it down now. Getting real about this story is everything. Your honesty is what opens the door for you to remember and accept your hidden power. Take a moment to reread your low vibe story and how it makes you feel. Then immediately say out loud, 
I am determined to see with love. I surrender the story and let the universe do her thing. Make this your mantra. Whenever you notice yourself stuck in your low vibe story, witness it and say, I am determined to see with love. Be the non-judgmental witness of your fear and surrender it to the universe. Step two, let your feelings navigate your path. The next step in unlocking your hidden power is to get clear about how you want to feel. In my case, I was more focused on finding a home that logically made sense than finding a home that made me feel at home. Once we let go of logic and let our feelings navigate us, the universe stepped in. Universal Lesson Be unapologetic about how you want to feel. In Chapter 4, I led you to begin your commitment to joy. Now it's time to embrace it fully. Take a moment to get crystal clear about how you want to feel. What does it feel like to be in a place of joy? What do you want to manifest into your life and how do you want to feel? Write about it now. Step three, ask for your sign. This is the fun part. It's the time for you to ask for your sign. Remember, asking for a sign means that you're willing to collaborate with the universe. It means that you're committed to releasing structure and control to instead be led by a power greater than yourself. If you don't get your sign, that's a sign too. Asking for clear guidance is an exercise in receiving good orderly direction that is unrelated to what you think is right. Remember and trust that the universe has a better plan than you do. You can ask for a sign to guide you toward anything you desire. If you're unsure about a decision or simply want to know you're on the right track, ask for a sign. And don't get hung up about what your sign should be. Just choose the first thing that comes to your mind. Maybe you think of an animal or a song or a book title. Just let whatever comes to your mind become your sign. Let it come to you naturally and commit to what you hear. Often people receive signs as numbers in sequence, like 1111 or 444. Or maybe your sign is a song, a fragrance, or a name. Without overthinking, decide what your sign will be. Write it down now. Step four, turn it over to the universe and be patient. Now let's turn your desire over to the universe with a prayer. Thank you, universe, for offering me clarity. Show me my sign if I'm moving in the right direction. Now be patient. Remember, the moment I surrendered my need to find the owl, I created space for the owl to appear. Try not to control your sign. I've had friends try to manipulate their signs. For instance, one friend chose the number 108 as her sign. If she saw a 54, she'd think it was her sign because 54 times 2 is 108. Let's not overreach. Your sign will be crystal clear if you're going in the right direction. And always remember that if it's not clear, then that too is divine guidance. Colette Baron-Reed says that your sign needs to be like a billboard, so clear that you cannot deny it. Some signs come quickly and some take time. If you don't get your sign right away, don't worry. There may be some personal fears you need to clear up or perhaps faith you need to strengthen before you can get it. If you're not getting your sign right away, consider that your impatience may be blocking it. Often when we're impatient it is because we do not trust in the outcome. If you're impatient, maybe it's because you're afraid that something won't happen the exact way you want it to or exactly when you want it to happen. Remember that this need to control the outcome stems from your lack of faith in the universe. There's also the belief that if something doesn't happen in the time frame that you want, that something bad will happen. Worse, this places your happiness and safety in the outcome. When you place your happiness and safety in the outcome, you lose sight of a plan beyond your own. You cut off your communication with the universe and disconnect from all the infinite possibilities that could occur. The key to releasing this control is to surrender your outside needs and obsessions and remember that nothing can take away your true power, the love and peace within you. The moment you embrace your peace within and surrender the outcome is the moment the universe can truly get to work. A powerful example I hear often involves women trying to conceive. I witness many friends obsess over when they'll get pregnant or why it's taking so long to do so. They track their ovulation, they pee on a stick, and they have passionless sex worried only about the outcome. When that doesn't work, many turn to IVF for help. Interestingly, I've seen many such women conceive just prior to the actual IVF procedure. Why? The impending procedure allowed them to relax and trust in a plan beyond their own, which allowed nature to do her thing. Imagine if we lived with a presence of peace regardless of the outcome. The key to living with that peace is to surrender. 
Then when you think you've surrendered, surrender some more. Trust in the power of the universe and relax into an energy of receptivity. Stay committed to your prayer, relax, and let the signs of the universe be your guide. This may seem difficult when you're deeply attached to an outcome, but you'll come to learn that it's actually much easier to surrender. The universe loves and supports us all. We just need to remember to realign with the energy of love so that we can receive it. Let your sign be gentle reminders that you are loved and guided. Universal Lesson You are always being supported. Step 5. Welcome Creative Possibilities Of course, asking for signs is just one way we allow the universe to support us. We should also be open to creative opportunities. The moment my husband and I shifted from the limitations of our practical ideas and opened up to the creative possibilities was the moment the universe stepped in. When we were willing to design our life from a creative place, the universe can come out and play. If you're ready to receive creative possibilities, say this prayer. Thank you, universe, for transforming limitation and doubt into creative possibilities. Use this prayer when your logical mind gets the best of you and stay open to receive new and innovative ways to perceive your circumstances. Maybe you'll get a message from a friend. Maybe it'll come from a song or a book. Some sort of clear direction toward creative ideas will be placed on your path. Be willing to let go of what you think you need and allow the power of the universe to lead you. Practicing the lessons in this chapter will help you tap into a more playful energy. Your willingness to play, have fun, and be creative opens up your channel to communicate with the loving energy of the universe. Joy is the ultimate creator. I find that when I'm not having fun, I feel blocked and stuck and my inner guidance system is shut down. Then the moment I choose to realign with fun and creativity, I feel energy begin to flow and tingle throughout my body. That fun, joyful energy is right in line with the love of the universe. This is partly why children experience far more wonders and delight than adults. We must tap into our childlike self and commit to unlearning the limitations of the world to remember the playfulness of our true essence, which is love. In this state, you will receive your signs and guidance will become natural. What would happen if you chose to be more playful and have more fun? This concept may bring up resistance because we're taught to live in the opposite way. We're taught that we must struggle to achieve and that success comes from making things happen. We learn that good things don't happen without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I challenge you to move beyond these beliefs of limitation and suffering. I challenge you to accept that you're here to have fun. Let's recap the steps from this chapter. Witness your low vibe story and how it makes you feel. Honor what you want and how you want to feel. Choose your sign that will be the gentle reminder from the universe that you're on track with the energy and flow of love. Turn over your desires to the care of the universe and be patient. Patience is the key to receiving guidance. Become open to receive creative possibilities. Get psyched about your capacity to connect with the universe. You have denied your power for far too long. Now is your time to receive love, light, and a sense of deep connection. If you have doubt about this process, have no fear. In Chapter 6, I teach you that even obstacles offer you guidance. When you tune into the loving frequency of the universe, everything in your life becomes a divine opportunity for optimal growth, healing, and freedom. Commit to your new prayers and affirmations and open your heart to continue on this beautiful journey of new perceptions. As I wrap up this chapter, I'm taking a moment to reflect on where I am and how I let fun lead the way. Fun led me to this very moment. I'm sitting at my desk, looking out at the most epic view from my new office in my mountain house. I smile knowing that the universe had a plan for me, and I'm grateful that I followed the guidance I received. Chapter 6. Obstacles are detours in the right direction. One afternoon, I was taking a cab uptown with my husband for a meeting. In the cab, we had a petty argument about something meaningless. The argument was ridiculous, but it triggered each of us in such a way that we couldn't let it go. Unfortunately, this pettiness had become the norm. We'd been fighting about silly things for several months, and we couldn't seem to find a way out of the pattern. While I deeply wanted to be right in the situation, I also wanted to be happy. So after a few minutes of bickering, my inner wisdom snuck in with guidance. I heard, pray for healing and resolution. I called on the holy instant and invited in love. I said to myself, 
Thank you for reorganizing this for me and helping me let go of littleness. I felt his energy lighten. Following our meeting, my husband and I headed to the elevator to leave the building. The elevator door opened and I said, Wait, I have to ask one more question. I ran back to the office, got my question answered, and returned to the elevator. We headed down 17 flights and landed on what we thought was the ground floor. We waited a moment, but the elevator door didn't open. We quickly realized we were stuck. This was the second time in a year that I'd been stuck in an elevator, so I began freaking out. Remembering that my husband was claustrophobic, my fear multiplied. The first few minutes of being stuck felt like an hour. We were sweating, peeling off layers of clothes, and pacing back and forth while trying to communicate with the building manager through the elevator emergency phone. The building manager kept saying, the repairman is on his way. In New York City, though, on the way doesn't necessarily mean soon. For all we knew, the repairman might have to contend with an hour's worth or more of traffic. We were stuck with no clue when we'd get out. About 10 minutes into the experience, I heard my inner voice again. The voice of wisdom said to me, Zach is going to freak out. You must be the light. I got the message loud and clear, and I redirected my focus onto my husband. I started tickling his back, rubbing his ears, and talking to him about all the things he's interested in. I even let him talk about how he wanted to design the kitchen in the mountain house. I was doing all the things he always wanted me to do. I was giving him love, focus, and attention. In this moment, stuck in the elevator, my focus was redirected on what truly mattered, my connection to my husband. And it worked. 20 more minutes went by and my husband was staying calm. He was enjoying his massage and we'd thought up some creative ideas for the house. His claustrophobia hadn't gotten the best of him. Rather, he was at peace. Then around the 45 minute mark, I began to get antsy. I said a loud prayer. Universe, we need help. We're ready to get out of here. Within minutes, we heard the repairman working on the door. Soon after the door opened, we saw we were stuck between the first and second floors. We gathered our stuff and jumped out of the elevator into a crowded lobby filled with people returning from lunch. We were relieved to be out. My husband looked at his cell phone and the time was 1.11 p.m. We gasped with delight knowing that the number one in sequence is a sign that the universe is guiding you. Doreen Virtue, the author and medium, says that when you see the number one in sequence that there's guidance around you. With this experience, the universe offered us a beautiful spiritual assignment a gentle reminder that obstacles are detours in the right direction. Though it may seem like a nightmare to be stuck in an elevator with your claustrophobic husband for 45 minutes, in truth it was a blessing. In the cab, I prayed for a miracle to get out of the cycle of ongoing petty arguments and reconnect with my husband. And on that day, the universe locked us in an elevator until we could restore our connection and love. When you ask for guidance, the universe may throw you a curveball. Sometimes divine lessons come in odd forms. In our case, being stuck in that elevator got me to let go of the littleness and restore my thoughts back to love and my energy back toward my husband. When everything was removed, we could realign with what was true, which is love. The story reminds us that every situation can be seen as a powerful opportunity to allow the universe to redirect our path. When we call on the holy instant through prayer, we realign with the energy of love. Then our loving consciousness expands and we become receptive to guidance that may be far different from our own plan. Our only job is to trust that whatever we've been guided toward is exactly the direction we need. Even situations that appear to be obstacles are actually opportunities, detours in the right direction. Always trust the direction of the universe and know you're being guided toward love. Universal lesson. Obstacles are detours in the right direction. A Course in Miracles says, Miracles rearrange perception and release you from all lack and isolation. Practicing the holy instant and entering into a miracle mindset is the clearest path toward grace. Clear direction may not always be presented to you immediately, but know you're on the right path. This knowing is crucial to your happiness and peace. When you get into the know and accept that even the most difficult obstacles can be divine intervention, you can deepen your faith in the universe. When you choose to see your obstacles as detours in the right direction, you can begin to find a deeper meaning and personal growth amid the discomfort. Maybe you can connect to a higher purpose, make a real connection to someone, or even be set on a path that will redirect the course of your life in an ultimately positive way not otherwise possible. 
All obstacles that are perceived with love can be transformed into the greatest life lesson. Throughout my life, I've met many people who have heroically shown up for their detours with a miracle mindset and as a result shifted the course of their lives and the lives of others. A powerful example is my dear friend Chris Carr. It's likely you're familiar with Chris. She's a well-known leader in the wellness and personal growth world. On Valentine's Day in 2003, at age 31, Chris was diagnosed with a rare form of stage 4 cancer. Through a tremendous amount of spiritual practice, love, and inner wisdom, Chris was able to rise above the fears of the world and embrace the love of the universe. She was able to see this life obstacle as a divine detour in the right direction. Chris's perceptual shift has led her to become a transformational healing voice for the masses. Chris knows that freedom from fear is the true healing and the story she is here to share. She loves her body for all that it is, and she embraces her life obstacles as her greatest opportunity to serve and grow. Chris is my hero. What would it be like if we all harnessed our own inner Chris Carr? If we were able to face fear with a miracle mindset and reorganize our fear into purpose and love? How different would our world be if everyone lived in this way? This is my mission to guide you to choose love no matter what so that you can turn all obstacles into opportunities for spiritual growth. The key to trusting in the universe's plan is to let go of all outcomes. When we get hung up about how something should turn out, then we disconnect with the flow of the universal guidance. The energy behind a should mentality is controlling and manipulating. The universe does not align with that energy. Therefore, we cut off communication and receptivity. It's when we let go of the outcome that we open up our perceptual world and allow ourselves to be led. My former coaching client, Sarah, spent many years dating a certain type of man, the guy she thought she should be with. On paper, these guys had all the credentials, looks, money, compatibility, religious faith, and shared values. She thought she was on the right path toward creating a long-term relationship, and yet time and time again, these relationships abruptly ended. Each time her boyfriend would seemingly end things out of nowhere, saying something like, I'm not sure why I need to end this. You're so great in everything I thought I was looking for, but for some reason, I don't think I'm the right guy for you. By the time I met Sarah, she was 40 years old, single, and at her wit's end. She came to me for private coaching to try to fix whatever was wrong with her so that she could maintain a relationship. After four months of coaching Sarah, I could see how she was always looking for a very specific person. She had a narrow set of guidelines and high expectations. Her need to find the right kind of man was greatly limiting. She was clearly blocking an awesome opportunity because she wasn't letting the universe guide her. She was relying on her own strength and needs, trying to fulfill a limiting belief that a good man came in just one type of package. I presented this theory to Sarah, and after a little pushback, she began to cry and said, Gabby, I agree. For my entire life, I've been trying to attract the man my mother always wanted me to be with. My father was absent in my life, and my mother taught me that I would only be happy with a successful Catholic man who made a lot of money and could provide for me. So I've been obsessed with finding the man of my mother's dreams. I honored Sarah for her willingness to see her fearful pattern. I went on to share that her controlling energy was likely the reason she hadn't been able to sustain a long-lasting relationship. Each man could feel her fear and controlling vibe and intuitively knew they were the wrong fit. It was time for Sarah to reorganize her perceptions and realign with the power of the universe. The first step was to help Sarah see how she had been blocking her connection to the guidance of the universe. I needed her to understand how her perceived obstacles were actually detours in the right direction. Her failed relationships were the universe telling her that her mother's idea of her ideal man wasn't necessarily her ideal man. I also helped Sarah see how her controlling energy, backed with fear that her mother had instilled in her, was unattractive, making it almost necessary for any man to want to walk away. The next step was to help Sarah release her needs and expectations and surrender to a guidance and wisdom beyond her logic and reason. It was time for her to turn to the universe for help. I offered her a prayer that would help her let go of control and embrace flow. The prayer goes, Thank you, universe, for helping me see beyond my limitations. Thank you for expanding my perceptions so that I can attract genuine love. For more than a month, Sarah recited this prayer daily. As the days went on, she began to feel a deep sense of relief and happiness. She loved the idea that she no longer had to figure everything out and that she could finally let go of her need to control her romantic relationships. 
Sarah's capacity to let this prayer reorganize her energy was the miracle she had been longing for. For the first time, she felt complete without a romantic partner. Embodying the confidence of knowing the universe had her back, Sarah became super attractive. Out of nowhere, all kinds of men were asking her on dates, men she'd never expected to even find her appealing. These men were far different than her mother's idea of a great man, but they were awesome nonetheless. One man in particular, Michael, was very persistent. Logically, Michael made no sense to her. He was struggling with his career, and he had no kind of financial security. Also, he wasn't Catholic. In other words, none of the characteristics Sarah thought she had been searching for. Nevertheless, she continued to say yes whenever Michael asked her out. After a few months of casually dating Michael, Sarah called me out of the blue. She said, Gabby, I've never been happier in my life. Michael makes me feel so safe, confident, and secure. I love being with him. I feel like he was waiting for me all this time. I'm so glad I opened up to receive him. Ten months later, Michael and Sarah were engaged. Sarah was right. Michael was waiting for her. And the universe knew. Each man who broke up with Sarah along the way have seemed like an obstacle. But in reality, each was a detour guiding her to shift her energy, rely on the universe, and trust in a new direction. Universal Lesson The universe will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Let Sarah's story inspire you to finally let go of what you've been holding on to. In what ways are you blocking your Michael? Whether it's a romantic partner, a career transition, a health choice, or a cross-country move, how are you controlling your experiences and misaligning with the flow of the universe? Let me take you through the step-by-step -step process that helps Sarah see her obstacles as a detour in the right direction and allow the universe to guide her toward love. You can apply this practice to any area of your life, and you can trust that the universe will hook you up. Step 1. Is the word should blocking your flow? In what way is your should mentality co-creating the obstacles in your life? Write down the area of your life where you're focusing on the shoulds and manipulating the outcome. Write down your shoulds now. Step 2. Pray to surrender your shoulds and see your obstacle with love instead of fear. The next time you get hung up in a victim mentality over why something isn't working out the way you planned, simply say this prayer and realign with love. Thank you, universe, for helping me see this obstacle as an opportunity. I will step back and let you lead the way. This prayer will offer you a way through every block. Test drive it today with something simple. Maybe you feel stressed and overwhelmed by your work life. Say this prayer and let the universe reorganize your day. Or maybe you're caught up in a family drama and you can't release your resentment. Say this prayer and let love take over. Let this prayer rearrange your perception and move you beyond limitation and doubt. Step three, turn it over. Turn over your obstacles to the care of the universe through this beautiful meditation. In this meditation, I call on a group of angels to support your practice of surrender. Whether you believe in angels or not doesn't matter. All you have to do is allow the images in this meditation to represent symbols of faith that help you release your need to control. Follow my guidance. Sit comfortably on the floor or upright in a chair. Close your eyes. Roll your shoulders back and lengthen your spine. Take a deep breath in and hold it. Then on the exhale, release. Take another deep breath in, honoring all that you have been holding on to. And on the exhale, release it. Continue to breathe long and deep throughout the rest of the meditation. Imagine yourself sitting comfortably in a safe space that you love. See yourself at ease. Settle into this space and know that you are held, protected, and supported. Now take a moment to acknowledge the area of your life that you've been controlling. Allow yourself to feel whatever feelings arise when you focus your attention on this situation. Honor what comes up for you and continue to breathe long and deep. In your mind's eye, begin to hold a vision of a small golden basket placed in front of you. 
This basket is illuminated from the inside out. When you're ready, gently place the area of your life that you've been controlling into the basket. Offer it up and surrender it fully. Set the intention now to fully release the need to control and allow the universe to take over. Take a deep breath and honor your devotion to surrender. Now hold a vision of a beautiful angel stepping behind you. The angel gently places their hands on your back and assures you that it is safe to let go of your need to control. Then the angel picks up the basket and flies away, waving goodbye. You have released it to the universe and it is being taken care of. Sit in stillness for a few minutes as a new, relaxed energy settles in. When you're ready, gently open your eyes to the room. Once you've practiced this meditation, you can trust that the universe has heard your call. This practice helps you set a powerful intention to release your need to control and embrace a new pathway. Now that you've surrendered your obstacles, it's important to be open to whatever plan the universe has in store for you. It's very likely that the plan will be far different from what you expected or hoped for. Remember that the guidance you're receiving is leading you in the right direction, even if it feels like a detour at first. Stay committed to that truth and you'll feel fully supported. Let's recap your steps. Accept that obstacles are detours in the right direction. Get honest about how you're controlling certain circumstances in your life. Then use your prayer. Thank you, universe, for helping me see this obstacle as an opportunity. I will step back and let you lead the way. Practice the guidance meditation to lead you into a surrendered state of patience and peace. Trusting that your obstacles are detours in the right direction helps you align with the power of the universe and gain relief. In Chapter 7, I guide you toward the next important step in trusting the universe, the practice of certainty. Certainty will serve and support you in ways you could never imagine. This next step is crucial to your happiness and peace. Chapter 7. Certainty Clears the Path for What You Desire In 2005, early in my sober recovery, I was busy reading all types of self-help books, watching Hay House DVDs, listening to spiritual podcasts, and soaking up all the guidance I could get my hands on. There was one DVD in particular I just loved. The DVD was called You Can Heal Your Life, and it featured many of the authors whose faces graced my bookshelves, including Louise Hay, Christian Northrup, and the amazing Dr. Wayne Dyer. It was Wayne Dyer's part of the film that I found most moving, and I would watch him on repeat. I fell madly in love with his profound one-liners, such as, As you think you shall be and you see it when you believe it. These became my mantras, and through Wayne's guidance, I began to place great emphasis on choosing the thoughts I desired to co-create my own reality. Each day I took Wayne's advice and willingly suspended my disbelief. I'd let go of all limitation and allow my mind to dream. I held visions of writing spiritual books in which I would express the incredible healing and growth I was experiencing. I saw myself as a speaker and teacher, I would create images of myself leading talks alongside these great teachers and offer guidance to audiences who, like me, longed for personal growth and healing. I stayed true to my visions, strengthened my certainty, and trusted the universe was supporting my work. My certainty gave me a sense of peace. I never felt the need to push my career ahead and instead trusted there was a plan. The universe responded well to my peace of mind. In time, my certainty turned into form and my visions became my reality. In 2009, I signed my first book deal for Add More Ink to Your Life, A Hip Guide to Happiness. As soon as I received a galley of the book, I sent a copy to Wayne Dyer. I mailed the book to an address in Maui with no expectation of getting a response. Along with the book, I enclosed a thank you note to Wayne for helping me turn my visions into form. It felt amazing just knowing I had sent the book, regardless of whether he got it. A few weeks later, I received a letter in the mail postmarked from Maui. I opened the envelope to find a handwritten note from Wayne Dyer. He thanked me for the book and encouraged me to continue moving forward with my career. I was blown away by his generosity and love. 
I couldn't believe he took the time to respond to me. Several months later, I attended a Hay House event in New York City where Wayne was the headline speaker. I was sitting in the front row, hanging on every word. Midway through his talk, Wayne grabbed a book from a table on the stage and started talking about a young new author who had published her first book. He said this young woman will be on this stage one day speaking to an audience this large. She will be a fantastic teacher, and I want you all to go out and buy her book. And then he said, Gabrielle Bernstein, please stand up and say hi to the audience. I was shocked. I hadn't realized that he was talking about me. I stood up and waved to the audience and thanked Wayne for his generosity. That moment was better than anything I'd dreamed about. Three more years passed, and in that time I published another three books. The visions I held of being a speaker, author, and spiritual teacher were coming into form. The more I enjoyed the process and focused on the service and joy behind my work, the more it was supported by the universe. Then one day in 2014 in New York City, I walked out onto the stage at the Javits Center to give a talk. Stepping onto the stage and looking out at the big audience, I realized this was the exact stage where Wayne had stood years before foreshadowing this moment. My longtime vision had come into true form. As you think, you shall be. Hard work, passion, and commitment can bring you all the support you need to fulfill your life's purpose. Certainty of outcome, however, is the secret ingredient. When we are certain, we can relax into a sense of knowing and faith. My all-time favorite passage from A Course in Miracles is, those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait and wait without anxiety. This passage gives me a sense of power. We all long for certainty in our lives, but our world feels anything but certain. We've grown to believe in fear, powerlessness, and doubt. The messages in this book are meant to challenge these limiting beliefs and encourage you to take on a new perspective, one that lets you learn to trust fully in a path and a power greater than you. When you let yourself dream big dreams and learn to rely on your inner wisdom, you'll receive the gift of certainty. Universal Lesson The path to certainty requires a profound desire to be free from fear. My commitment to freedom from fear gave me the strength to embrace certainty in an uncertain world. The freedom I speak of is an inner peace that can only come from genuine faith in the universe. When we choose to believe in the faith of the world, we are afraid. But when we lean on the faith of the universe, peace becomes real. Freedom and peace are frequently under attack, particularly when you feel powerless over a situation. In our lives, many situations arise that seem to be out of our control. The loss of a loved one, a frightening diagnosis, or news of a terrifying world event. And as a result, we lose faith. Even when everything is seemingly going great, we can lose faith. It's common for me to hear stories of people who, thanks to their committed spiritual path, have manifested awesome lives. And yet the presence of fear knocks them down. They tell themselves stories like, this is too good to be true, or it's too good to last. And just like that, certainty proves them right. But it's okay. Understand that we are programmed to have more faith in fear than certainty in love. Allowing the creative flow of love to move through us is the feeling we long for. Oftentimes we look for that feeling in a drink, a romantic partner, or some kind of worldly success. Looking back at my addiction, it's clear I was searching for that creative flow too, just in the wrong place. Once I got sober, I shifted my search inward to realign with the energy of love. My commitment to my inner life through prayer and meditation strengthened my faith and certainty in the love of the universe. I learned that I could simply step back and allow the creative force of love to work through me. This is when I truly began living. The following lessons will strengthen your faith on the path toward certainty. The Course says, Trust would settle every problem now. Practice these lessons and you'll begin to experience a sense of certainty no matter what's going on in your life. Add up the moments of faith and surrender to certainty. Step 1. Get ready. Readiness is the first step on the path toward certainty. Are you ready to detach from the narratives, fears, and limitations of the world? Are you ready to put your greatest visions above the littleness of fear? Are you ready to let go of the past stories, experiences, and circumstances that led you into doubt? If the answer is yes, then you've begun the journey toward certainty. Remember, you don't need to know how you'll get out of these limitations. 
You just need to be ready. What would you do if you lived with faith and certainty? Write down your answer. Commit to this statement and set certainty in motion. Step two, think it, feel it, believe it. The second step on the path to certainty is to remember that your thoughts and visions create your reality. Much like my visions of being on the same stage with Wayne ultimately became my reality, you too can create the world you want to see. To help you in the creation process, let's practice a meditation in which I will guide you to align with your greatest desire. In the meditation, allow yourself to experience an emotional connection to your desire. Let go of the outcome and enjoy the feelings of desire, knowing that the universe will respond to your positive emotions. Universal lesson. The frequency you embody supports the experiences that you have. Creation meditation. Before we begin, make sure you have a notebook and pen beside you. You will use them immediately following the meditation. If you're driving, practice this later. If you like to meditate to music, I often recommend using a certain mantra for this visioning meditation. This Kundalini mantra is Ek Onkar Satgur Prasad Satgur Prasad Ek Onkar. This mantra means that there is one creator of all creation. This mantra is the only Kundalini mantra that comes with a warning. Whatever you're thinking about while you're listening to or singing the mantra will manifest in your life. You will be in such a state of manifestation that your thoughts will have even more power than usual. Simply stay aware of your thoughts while listening to the mantra and consciously choose to lean in toward what you desire. You can download the mantra at gabbybernstein.com forward slash universe. Begin your meditation in silence or with the mantra. Sit comfortably on the floor or a chair and close your eyes. Roll your shoulders back and straighten your spine. Place your palms on your thighs facing upward to receive the energy of the universe. Take a deep breath in and expand your diaphragm. On the exhale, allow your diaphragm to contract. Continue this cycle of long, deep breaths throughout your meditation. Take a moment to think of a desire that you've carried for some time, possibly a romantic love that you hope for, a sense of physical or emotional peace, a baby, or even reaching a place of clarity and inspiration. Honor your desires now. Now lean into this desire even more. Begin to imagine yourself living out this intention. See yourself walking hand in hand with your romantic partner or see your body free from pain and illness. What images come to mind? Simply allow your mind to wander and bless you with creative visions. Honor whatever visions come to mind. If at any time during your meditation you feel a sense of doubt or fear, simply honor the feeling. Feel it in your body and allow it to pass. You don't need to push away the fear or doubt. Just allow it to come and go throughout your creative meditation journey. Honor the feeling and then return to the vision of what you desire. Continue to commit even more to the visions you desire. Breathe even deeper now and allow your breath to align your physical energy with the emotions of your creative visions. Let the feeling of the visions move through you naturally. Sit comfortably for five to 10 minutes in the energy of this creative flow. If you choose to listen to the mantra in your meditation, you can chant along with Ek Onkar Satgur Prasad, Satgur Prasad, Ek Onkar. When you're ready, gently take a deep breath and release it. Then open your eyes to the room. Immediately following your meditation, open a notebook. At the top of the page, write, Thank you, Inner Wisdom, for writing through me. I invite the loving energy of the universe to take over and lead me to a place of certainty. Free write for 10 minutes. Write down the visions you received. Let your pen flow and don't edit a word. Step three, get into a dialogue with the universe. Afterward, take a moment to reread what you wrote. Allow yourself to be moved by the inspired ideas that came through you. Let yourself be vulnerable and connected to your visions. 
Let the universe communicate messages or reassurance through your free writing exercise. In some cases, you may not have written anything connected or inspired. That's fine. New relationships don't always flow at first. Getting into a relationship with the universe takes time, commitment, and conviction. This is the first exercise in the book in which we actually get into a written dialogue with the inspiration of the universe. Stay committed to this practice and bring the free writing exercise into your daily meditation. Your practice of welcoming in a conversation with the universe will be the beginning of a new relationship. When you surrender and allow the energy of love to move through you, many inspired ideas and intuitive thoughts will arise. In time, as you continue this practice, more and more loving wisdom will come through. Words and ideas that you never could have come up with on your own will land on the page. Your handwriting might even change, and the lexicon you use may expand. Don't edit your words. Just allow the wisdom to move through you. The more comfortable you become in this connection, the more certain you'll be that there is a power greater than you working full-time on your behalf. You'll naturally begin to channel the energy of love. In fact, whether we know it or not, we all channel all the time. We're either channeling the thoughts of fear or we're channeling the voice of love. When we pray and meditate, we immediately lock into our connection to love and surrender to our higher wisdom. It's our daily commitment to choose love, tune in, and converse with the universe that sets us up to live with certainty that we're being guided and supported. Living with certainty is so much fun. You can walk through life with a sense of safety, security, and power. You'll no longer feel disconnected from others and out of alignment. You'll know a new sense of connection that you can't get from any kind of material goods, titles, awards, degrees, and so on. This connection is everlasting and trusting, and it sets you free. Step four, co-create with the universe. The final step in the pathway to certainty is to co-create with the universe. Tap into the images and emotions that came through your meditation and free writing exercise. Keeping those images and emotions in mind, try to feel what it would actually be like to live in that world. Think your way into the experience of what it's like to be living in your desire. Single and in my late 20s, I remember longing for a husband. So many of my friends were moving in with their boyfriends and getting engaged. At the time, my true desire was to manifest the love of my life. Instead of letting fear and doubt discourage me, I brought my desire to the universe for help. I declared my readiness. I used my creative visualizations and meditation to help me feel the feelings of romance that I longed for. Then I took those emotions with me. Throughout the day, no matter where I was, I'd conjure up the feelings that I felt on my meditation pillow. The feeling of desire, love, romance, and excitement. I'd walk through the streets of New York City as though I had a romantic partner by my side. I'd imagine myself holding hands with my partner, close and loved. This was a very creative practice. I became a super attractor. After a week of walking around feeling these feelings, I was being asked on lots of dates. Guys started calling me out of the blue, and I noticed men checking me out on the street. I was putting out the super attractive energy of love and romance. If you walk around feeling defeated, doubtful, and sad, the universe can't supply you with the high vibes of positivity. When you walk through life conjuring up the feelings that you want to feel, the manifestation process begins, and your desires are reflected back to you. Test drive this practice once a day for a week and take note of what happens. Tap into your desired feelings and walk around with those emotions emanating from your energy field. Let these feelings of joy and desire support you in co-creating what you truly want to call into your life. Walking through life consciously choosing how you want to feel, regardless of what's happening around you, strengthens your faith and certainty. You'll feel certain because even if the actual desire has not yet manifested into form, it's manifested into your emotions. I spent nine months in the practice of feeling romantic love around me. In that time, I felt certain that my partner was on the way. Even when a date didn't work or a guy wouldn't call back, I'd quickly return to my desired feeling and regain my faith. That faith and certainty is what allowed me to remain receptive during that time and ultimately attract a loving partner who today I call my husband. Over time, your visions will easily manifest into your reality and you'll truly know what it means to paint the portrait of your life. You'll see clearly how what you create is a direct reflection of your certainty and faith in the universe. Most important, when you begin to co-create with the universe, you serve the world in a truly expansive way because you become an expression of joy. 
It's important to become mindful of how you use your connection to the universe. Far too often I've seen people use their connection for the wrong reasons. I often see folks get caught up in an obsessive co-creation. For example, consider my friend Sam. Sam spent an entire year obsessively trying to manifest a new job title at work. His strong focus on getting the new title made him come off as needy, controlling, and energetically annoying. The need to get to a higher place actually pissed off his boss, and Sam never got the title that he ultimately deserved. I helped Sam see that his controlling desire was actually blocking the support of the universe. There was nothing wrong with wanting the title, but consider what might happen if Sam's desire was to truly enjoy his work and be of service to his customers, his coworkers, and the company. When you redirect your focus off what you're going to get and onto how you want to feel, the universe can get involved in the co-creation. When you co-create with a needy and manipulative energy, you may still manifest the desire of your focus, but it's not likely to last. The relationship may come in or some business deal might materialize, but the benefits to your soul and the lasting happiness you seek won't be satiated. You will have shortchanged yourself of the joy and lasting benefits that come with following the steps I've outlined. When you're aligned with genuine feelings that bring you joy, then the universe will support your desires. Now, having said that, recognize that we all get entangled in the ego manifesting routine. It's to be expected. I want to call it out now so that you can be mindful of it and gently guide yourself back to truth whenever you get caught up in the obsession of the how and when things will manifest. Instead of obsessing about the outcome, focus on how you want to feel. The way to get your needy and controlling vibe out of the way is to stop praying for what you think you need and instead pray for the highest good for all. Whenever you pray for the highest good, you get your agenda out of the way. You surrender into the universe's plan and release your own. Remember, the universe doesn't respond to manipulation. The universe responds to love. Certainty brings forth an energy of peace. That is the goal. To live in this world, but believe in a peaceful, loving world beyond it. Our faith in a world beyond our physical sight is what allows for genuine peace to set in. A Course in Miracles says, you are at peace and you bring peace with you wherever you are. When we accept that inner peace is a choice we make, then our physical worldview changes. Our true acceptance of that peace sets in when we fully embrace a spiritual relationship of our own understanding. Now I want to let you into my spiritual worldview in an effort to help you design your own. I believe in angels, spirit guides, ascended masters, and a community of loving entities who are always guiding us to lean toward love and unlearn the fears of the world. I believe that the universe is the ever-present energy of love within us and around us. I believe that in any given moment we can align with that powerful presence of love through prayer, contemplation, and stillness. We can measure our peace based on our ability to align with this force field of universal energy. I trust in these spiritual guides just as much as I trust in my husband or my mother. I believe in them deeply. I know they are working through me to strengthen my faith in the universe. Most of all, I believe that we are here in these bodies at this time to learn great spiritual lessons. As we come to embrace the light and transformation within these lessons, we're guided to spread the light to the rest of the world. I nurture this faith daily with prayer and meditation. This certainty sets me free. It's taken 36 years and many past lives for me to own these beliefs fully, and today I can say with full conviction that my certainty is the greatest blessing I have ever received. It is my mission to help guide you to know your own certainty. Maybe your faith lies in religious beliefs, or maybe you connect to the universe when you go for a long run or spend time with your children. I don't care how you find this connection. All I care about is that you establish a relationship with a higher power of your own understanding. The more energy and intention you bring to your faith, the more fearless and free you will be. Your fearless freedom will light up the world. When we witness certainty in others, we remember a truth that lies within us. It was Wayne Dyer's certainty and absolute faith in the universe that drew me to him. His faith 
strengthened mine. As I write this chapter, I celebrate Wayne's life as he left his body only a few days ago. My heart is heavy, and millions of people throughout the world are deeply saddened by our collective loss. But deep down I know, with certainty, that Wayne's spirit, enthusiasm, and guidance will never leave us. As we move on with the guidance and practices in this book, I will continue to encourage you to trust in your own spiritual faith. To help you further along your journey of certainty, I welcome you to take a moment to think about what the energy of the universe, God, or spirit means to you. There's no right or wrong answer when you're committed to love. Your faith in the universe will grow and strengthen daily. For now, honor where you are and trust what you believe in today. One day at a time, we can lift the veil and move from darkness to light, from fear to faith, and from disbelief to certainty. Let's recap the pathway to certainty that we covered in this chapter. The first step on the path toward certainty is your readiness. Stay willing to be free on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Tap into the feelings you desire through your meditation. Begin a dialogue with the universe through your writing exercises. Consciously co-create your reality by tapping into the feelings you desire and cultivating those feelings in moments throughout your day. Stop praying for an outcome and instead pray for the highest good for all. Establish a spiritual relationship of your own understanding. It will change and grow, but for today, honor your relationship to the universe. A Course in Miracles says, I lose the world from all I thought it was and choose my own reality instead. When you lean on certainty and faith, you change your mind about the world you see. Your faith has the power to turn trauma into healing, conflict into growth, and fear into love. Deepen your connection to the universe one meditation, prayer, and positive desire at a time. Let your faith be your guide as you release the perception of the world you thought you knew and embrace true freedom and peace. In the coming chapter, we build on your faith as you begin to recognize how the universe talks to you. The practices and stories in chapter 8 will guide you to deepen your daily dialogue with the universe so that the presence of love takes on a whole new role in your life. Get psyched for what's in store. Chapter 8. The Universe Speaks in Mysterious Ways In 2008, I went on a spiritual quest with my mother to Brazil to visit the medium John of God. John of God channels spirits to facilitate miraculous healing and spiritual growth. My primary intention for visiting Brazil was simply to accompany my mother on her wild journey. I didn't want her traveling all the way to Brazil alone. But deep down, I intuitively knew I was meant to be there. The night before we visited John of God, our tour guide suggested that we get clear about the healing and guidance we wanted to receive. I remember sitting in my dimly lit room in the Brazilian Posada, writing down my intentions in my journal. At the top of the page, I wrote this. I want to truly know God so that I can be free and teach with authenticity. My next intention for my visit with John of God was to receive support with my book, Add More Ing to Your Life. At the time, I didn't even have a publisher, but I was writing the book anyway because I wanted to bring my spiritual experiences to an audience of new seekers. I wrote down in my journal, Thank you, Spirit, for guiding me to the right literary partners who can support spreading my message throughout the world. The next day, I brought my intentions to John of God and received his blessing. Throughout my time in Brazil, I met some incredible people, one of whom was a lovely tour group shaman named Heather Cumming. Heather was also John of God's interpreter. At the time she was finishing the book, John of God, the Brazilian healer who's touched the lives of millions. Also in my group was Setsuko, a Japanese woman who translated spiritual books. Setsuko was in our tour group to experience John of God and meet with Heather so that she could translate Heather's book into Japanese. Throughout my two-week experience in Brazil, Setsuko and I had many conversations about the literary world. I told her all about my book and how I was ready to receive a publisher. While she didn't know me at all, she felt a strange certainty that my book would have an impact on the world. The day we left Brazil to head home, Setsuko said to me, Good luck with your book. I hope to translate it into Japanese someday. I smiled and thanked her for her generosity and support. 
Within a few months of visiting John of God, I landed the publishing deal I'd been hoping for. I finished and published my book within four months, an incredibly fast turnaround, and I trusted that the universe was ready to make it happen. Six months later, my book was published. I was visiting the Omega Center, a spiritual center in Rhinebeck, New York. I was having lunch with an Italian friend of mine who was looking for work as a book translator. He asked, do you know anyone in the translation field? I said, I only know one woman, Satsuko, who lives in Japan. I wouldn't even know how to get in touch with her, but I'll look into it. Fifteen minutes later, we headed to the Omega Cafe for tea. As I walked up the steps to the gift shop, I bumped into a man and a woman walking down the steps. I looked up, and it was Satsuko. I yelped, I was just talking about you. What on earth are you doing in the United States? She said, I can't believe I'm seeing you here. I just bought your book in the bookstore, and I was so proud of your accomplishment. Satsuko and I sat down for tea and caught up. Within minutes, she said, I know the universe has guided me to you so that I can translate your book into Japanese. I'll bring this to my editor and see if we can make it happen. With great gratitude, we celebrated the universal guidance and headed our separate ways. This was a wonderful encounter, plus my Italian friend made an awesome connection and received guidance for working in the field of translation. Three months later, I accepted my first Japanese offer for Add More Ink to Your Life, and Setsuko was the translator. Since that time, she's bid on my other books, and who knows, maybe she'll translate this one too. The synchronicity behind this event serves as another powerful reminder that the universe guides us wherever we focus our energy and intention. When we surrender our intentions and feel energized by the infinite possibilities, we will be amazed by how fast the universe responds. You may have experienced these types of undeniable synchronicities in your own life. Maybe you think about a loved one and they call you just as you pick up the phone to dial them. You say something casually and an hour later it happens. It's likely these moments come and go, and when they do, you're amazed because you can't actually believe it. In some ways, it seems too good to be true. You may chalk it up to coincidence, but in truth, it's much, much more. These synchronicities are the universe's way of guiding you to exactly what you need. When you tap into the loving frequency of the universe, you learn to live beyond the limitations of the world and accept good, orderly direction. You surrender your obsession with logic and embrace intuitive direction. You become aware of the great support within you and around you. My goal in this chapter is to help you fully embrace and surrender to this support from the universe as I show you how to practice using your intentions and connection for the highest good. Step 1. Understand that miracles are natural. When we get in sync with the universe, we begin to experience many miraculous and mysterious synchronicities. These synchronicities may seem wild and unexplainable at first, but the more faithful you become, the more commonly they occur. A Course in Miracles teaches us, miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. What's natural is our peaceful, loving instinct and our connection to the love of the universe. What's unnatural is the fear that defends against this connection. Fear, along with guilt, separation, judgment, and attack, block us from the miracles that are available to us all the time. When we believe in the love of the universe and allow it to move through us, we are a clear channel to receive great gifts and guidance. When synchronicity does not occur and we don't feel guided, it's a clear sign that we've fallen back into our fearful patterns. Our spiritual journey is an experience of remembering that we are love. The more we embody this truth, the more miracles we will experience. We accept that miracles are a natural part of who we are. And when we live in love, we live a miraculous life. Now, I don't expect you to become enlightened overnight and live in love all the time, but let's aim to bring in more love. When the light shines, the darkness cannot coexist with it. It's time to ignite your light and let it shine brightly so that you can own, honor, and embrace your true connection to the universe. Continue to pay close attention to when you're blocking miracles, and in that instant, choose again. Step 2. Look for love and expect miracles. This next step is to spend mindful moments throughout the day looking for love. When you deliberately focus your attention on love and joy, then you open the floodgates to receive miracles. Most of us get caught up in focusing on what's going wrong. 
But what if we spent our days looking at all that's going right? Make a conscious effort to look for love throughout the day. To ignite this process, begin your day with a prayer. I focus my attention on the love that is around me, and I expect miracles. Repeat this prayer and feel the power of these words. Know that your willingness to say these words out loud will set you on the right foot. When you look for love, you proactively collaborate with the universe to bring you back to a miracle mindset. Remember, a simple shift in your perception is a miracle. The moment that you forgive your spouse and move on from a stupid argument is a miracle. Or when you ask for a sign from the universe and you get it, it's a miracle. Miracles can be wild synchronicities or they can be simple shifts. The Course says there is no order of difficulty among miracles. It's important to celebrate these miracles by saying thank you to the universe. Thanking the universe reinforces your faith and trust that you're in sync with a power greater than yourself. Remember that your relationship with the universe is an ongoing conversation. The best conversations begin with the words, thank you. Step 3. Practice Non-Interference Pay attention to how your day shifts when you commit to love. The Course says, you need not do anything. You don't need to work miracles or make anything happen. You merely align with your true love nature and allow your eyes to see what you desire. The Course teaches that miracles are habits and should be involuntary. They should not be under conscious control. But consciously selected miracles can be misguided. With this important message, the Course reminds us to turn inward and ask for help whenever we disconnect from our miracle mindset. Miracles become involuntary when we make turning to love a habit. When we detour into fear, we can call on the universe to help us restore our thoughts back to love. Whenever we ask for help, the miracle will be presented. We don't need to do anything other than be receptive to the guidance that comes. This relaxed relationship with the universe gives us the chance to be at peace. Universal Lesson Whenever we forget our peaceful nature, we can ask the universe to remind us of what is real. I once led a weekend workshop at a retreat center for a large group of people. The group opened up quickly and shared a lot of their fears and stories throughout the weekend. Following the retreat, I drove back home with my friend Jenny and chatted about the weekend. Jenny said that while she really enjoyed the weekend, she was feeling a bit down because of all the sad stories and energy she had picked up from others. She also told me that for many months she'd been having trouble sleeping because of her fears about world events and some recent personal experiences. She felt paralyzed by fear. I took in what she said and suggested that she may not be creating clear energy boundaries with people and the world. I reminded her that through prayer she could be guided to a healing of the highest good. I suggested that she relax into prayer, trusting that whatever she needed would be presented to her. We said a prayer. I am love and miracles are natural. I welcome healing of the highest good. Moments after the prayer, I remembered a beautiful energy clearing meditation by a spiritual teacher named Doreen Virtue. I frequently use Doreen's meditation to clear out any fear, negative energy, or psychic attacks. I told Jenny about it, and she replied, That sounds cool. Send me the link when we get home. Ten minutes later, we were listening to a mix on my Spotify account. Then out of nowhere, light instrumental music started playing, and Doreen Virtue's voice came through the stereo. It was the energy clearing meditation. This meditation wasn't on my Spotify playlist, and I didn't even know that it was saved in my iTunes. We started screaming with excitement. The exact healing that she needed came through faster than she could even imagine. She looked at me and said, wow, I didn't even have to work for that. Miracles are natural. Then she shut her eyes and listened to the meditation. Coming out of the meditation, Jenny felt clear, energized, and released the negativity and tension she had been holding. When you pray, you get out of the way. Making prayer a daily practice will help you feel the flow of synchronicity and universal support all the time. Your connection to the universe will be present in all things. You'll think of something and it will appear. You'll set an intention and it will come into form. Practice your faith like a full-time job and try not to interfere with the universe's plan. Your faith and non-interference will make you feel relaxed. That relaxed state is the portal to receive universal guidance. Universal Lesson As long as you remain surrendered and committed to the highest good, everything you need will be shown to you. Step 4. Heighten your faith The next step in co-creating with the universe is to create a faith statement. This exercise begins with a question. 
What would your life be like if you knew you were always being guided? Take a moment to free write your response. What would you do differently if you knew that the universe had your back? Do you have spiritual proof that the universe is in fact guiding you? Write your story. If you don't have proof yet, you will by the time you complete this book. Feel free to revisit this lesson later. Feel the faithful energy that this story ignites. If you don't have your own spiritual proof, it's fine to lean on someone else's story or any of the stories in this book. Take a few moments to tap into the feelings of faith that these stories ignite. How does it feel to be in faith? What does your faith give you the freedom to do or be? Now let's create a faith statement. This statement helps you access your commitment to the universe and the positive co-creation of your life. The goal is to make a faith statement that ignites a feeling of love, connection, and inspiration within you. This statement can be whatever you want it to be. My faith statement is, I know that the universe is an ever-present energy field of love. I know that when I align with the energy of love through thoughts, actions, and beliefs, I am given infinite support and guidance. I know that I can co-create my reality with this loving presence so that I can live in joy and spread light. Reading this statement out loud moves me to tears. That's the goal. Write a faith statement that moves you from your core. Use some of what you've already written down in your responses above and write a statement that locks you into a heart-centered state of faith in the universe. Write your faith statement and don't edit a word. Write down whatever comes out. Don't judge what you write and don't try to make it perfect. Just let it flow. You can always expand upon your faith statement, so don't feel stuck in what you write. Step five, commit to your faith statement. Now that you have a faith statement, it's time to have some fun. For the next 24 hours, commit to living in faith. Begin now by reading your faith statement out loud to yourself, followed by this mantra. I trust in my connection to the universe, and I have faith I'm being guided. For the next 24 hours, walk through life leaning on your faith in the universe. When something feels in sync, celebrate it as a moment of alignment. When something goes wrong, recognize it as a detour in the right direction, offering you guidance and support. Choose to see all that occurs as loving guidance. Forgive your negative thoughts and actions and immediately return to your faith statement. If the thought of relying on your faith intimidates or overwhelms you, remember, this should be fun. It's a radical and awesome experiment in what it's like to live with trust in the universe and a commitment to love. Just for today, let's see how it feels to lean toward faith and love no matter what. At the end of the 24-hour period, take some time to reflect on your experience. In your notebook, Take an inventory of the miracle moments and write down an honest intake of when you resisted the support of the universe. If you enjoyed this exercise, keep it going. Continue to test drive your faith daily. Have fun with the practice of getting in sync with the universe. If your spiritual practice feels like work, then it becomes another thing to cross off your to-do list. The more playful and curious you are on your spiritual path, the more synchronicity you will witness. Co-create your experience with a sense of joy and an open mind. Savor the journey. While you complete this exercise, you'll get a glimpse of freedom that is available to you now. Committing to 24 hours of freedom is easy because you know that the next day you can go back to controlling and worrying. As much as you don't like it, you probably feel safe there. But my hope is that you'll find so much joy in your 24-hour experiment that you'll turn to it more often, even if it's for short periods of time. Let this practice become part of your spiritual routine. Give yourself freedom breaks from the chaos you create in your mind and your reality. These breaks can be a reprieve from all that you think you need to make and all that you think you need to control. Know that you can take an inner vacation whenever you choose, letting in light to allow your creative energy to come forth and attract you to what you desire. When you take time off from your chaotic and fearful ways, you begin to create new experiences. The fleeting moments of freedom you experience can be very powerful. They are pinpricks of light in the midst of vast darkness. The more often you allow the light to come in, the safer it feels to be free from the darkness. Fear is a habit, and this practice will guide you to make love a new habit, and in time will outweigh the pressure of fear. Bring this practice into your moment-to-moment -moment experiences. 
Stay in the flow with love. Each day, set positive intentions for yourself. Intend to be more loving to your partner. Intend to have a productive work day. Intend to eat more mindfully, and so on. When you set positive intentions, you send a clear message to the universe that you're ready to receive support. Your work is done. All you have to do then is be patient, have fun, and believe in miracles. Practicing these principles doesn't mean that you won't have problems. Conflicts are also a natural part of life, and when dealt with from a place of love, incredible opportunities for learning and growth. And when you commit to this practice, you will experience problems differently. Instead of freaking out, getting frustrated, or trying to force an outcome, your habitual response will be to lean on the universe for help. You can ask the universe to reveal to you the great lessons in each problem and remind you to return to love. The more you practice the habit of leaning on a miracle mindset, the faster your comeback rate will be. The faster you come back, the happier and more peaceful you will become. Of course, it's easy to accept that we can co-create the good stuff, but what about the obstacles? What about when you're fired out of the blue or when an unexpected health condition shows up? How are we co-creating these difficult circumstances in our lives? The bad times, just like the good, are a reflection of what we believe to be true about ourselves and our relationship to the universe. Oftentimes, our difficult circumstances reflect the stress, fear, and separation that we carry. It's important to witness the difficult situations in our life through the lens of love. Choose to see them as an opportunity to surrender to your spiritual practice even more. The amount of flow and synchronicity we experience can be measured by the depth of our spiritual connection. The guidance you desire in any area of life may come quickly or it may take time. And really, the timeline doesn't matter. In fact, time is irrelevant when you're working miracles. Just stay in the flow and believe. When I reunited with Satsuko and secured the Japanese deal, there was a part of me that wasn't even surprised. My trust in love and my commitment to miracles gave me the strong faith that this manifestation was in perfect alignment with the highest good. The Japanese deal came at the perfect time for the book and for Satsuko. The universe had a plan for us, and we cleared the path to receive it. Stay committed to love and get out of the way. That's the gig, folks. It really is that simple. This empowered way of living is available to you right now. Journeying through life, co-creating your reality with the universe is immensely fulfilling. Living in collaboration with the universe can change your entire life. Let's continue your journey of heightening your faith so that you can begin to fully embrace your relationship with the universe. Here's your recap of the steps. Miracles are natural. Let the universe support you. Look for love in all the right places by repeating this prayer throughout the day. I focus my attention on the love that is around me and I expect miracles. Practice non-interference. Miracles are habits and should be involuntary. Create your faith statement. Commit to your faith statement and recite it throughout the day. Your faith will be your greatest resource as we move into Chapter 9. In the coming pages, I invite you to begin the process of undoing fear and fully surrendering to the grace and love of the universe. Some of what I ask may seem challenging, but lean on your faith statement and we will clear the path to freedom and peace. Chapter 9. Oneness Sets You Free Six months into the process of writing this book, I found myself feeling like a fraud. Every so often, I'd catch something nasty sneaking its way into my conversations, my thoughts, and my interactions. Even though I was practicing the principles in this book, I felt out of alignment with my true love nature because one lingering bad habit, the habit of judgment. This judgment was a projection of a disowned part of my own shadow. It didn't matter how often I prayed, how service-oriented I'd become, or how long I meditated. My judgmental nature was blocking my connection to the universe. This behavior appeared innocent enough at first, but it left me feeling sad and disconnected. Judgment quietly but swiftly drained my happiness, reinforced a sense of separation from others, and blocked my connection to the universe. My neck hurt all the time, and I found myself getting into tense, petty arguments with my loved ones. I decided I needed to take a close look at what I was thinking, saying, and doing. I lovingly witnessed my behavior and came to realize that judgment was the cause of this disconnect. Seemingly innocent and minor moments of judgment were blocking me from my greatest resources, my presence, power, and capacity to experience the flow of love. 
When I began to pay attention to how judgment made me feel, I noticed that each time I judged, I came away with low energy and a sense of physical and mental weakness. A Course in Miracles says, the ego cannot survive without judgment. The ego seeks to divide and separate. Spirit seeks to unify and heal. So if judgment makes us feel separate, and compassion and understanding make us feel whole and unified, why do we spend so much time in judgment? It's partly because of the world in which we live. So much pop culture and media place a tremendous value on status, looks, and material wealth. We are made to feel less than without this or that possession. We use judgment to avoid the feeling of our own inadequacy, insecurities, and lack of self-worth. It can feel easier to make fun of someone for a perceived weakness than to look at our own sense of lack. Judgment and separation form the basis for so many of today's problems. Without judgment, we would see one another as equal. We'd have no feelings of better than or less than. We'd be one. Oneness is our true nature. When we're in tune with the feeling of oneness, then judgment and separation dissolve and our connection to the love of the universe is restored. After witnessing how judgment weakened my power, I decided to change my ways. I put myself on a path of clearing judgment so that I could release the pattern of separation and strengthen my experience of oneness. While tough at first, in time my judgmental nature began to subside. In fact, I no longer resonated with it. Very soon after, I found myself surprised by new business opportunities, interesting connections that I had longed to make, and stronger and more intimate personal relationships. Even my neck pain began to subside. Freeing myself from judgment instantly cleared the space for more love. In some ways, releasing judgment can feel like letting go of a friend you know deep down is not good for you. Even though in your heart you know it's time to move on, you feel a sense of sadness, loss, and disorientation. It can be scary to fully let go of judgment because it is a pattern that we grow to rely on. We use judgment to avoid the feeling of our own inadequacy, insecurities, and lack of self-worth. Instead of addressing those feelings, we look at the perceived shortcomings of others so we don't have to face our own pain. However, projecting our judgment onto others only serves as a temporary reprieve. Not only do our own feelings of inadequacy not dissolve, to make matters worse, we also feel an unconscious sense of guilt for judging others. Whenever you become aware that you're not feeling at peace and your life isn't flowing naturally, that's a clue that you've decided to align with the wrong mind of judgment. Judgment shows up in many ways. For instance, any time you think another person is your source of happiness or pain, you're in judgment. Often judgment shows up as jealousy, comparison, and envy. Judgment can be sneaky, presenting itself as justification for condemning someone you believe has wronged you. However, this judgment is what keeps us in the illusion that we are separate from one another. I experienced this lesson firsthand at a dinner party. My husband and I went to a friend's home for a get-together. When we arrived, we were escorted into a small room with six people eating appetizers and having drinks. There was a woman in the group who seemed to be dominating the conversation. She was speaking loudly, boasting about her career, and making sure that the conversation revolved around her. This behavior really triggered me. I kept thinking, who does she think she is? Why is she speaking so loudly? How can I get a word in? To combat her bombastic behavior, I started to speak loudly too. I made sure everyone knew who I was and how much I had going on. I went out of my way to be seen and heard. I was so annoyed by this woman and I became determined to make sure I could get my voice heard. Soon after, we sat down to dinner. Thankfully, the annoying woman was seated at the opposite end of the table so I wouldn't have to listen to her ridiculous stories. Although she was far away, I noticed her staring at me throughout the meal. This made me even angrier. Why is she staring at me? After dinner, everyone stepped outside to have more drinks. Because I've been sober for nearly 10 years, I stayed inside. At the moment, the annoying woman walked over to me. Ugh, I thought. She walked up to me and said, I noticed that you don't drink. I replied, no, I've been sober for nearly a decade. She responded, me too. I've been sober for seven years. In that moment, all separation dissolved. I recognized myself in her. I was able to see my judgment of her as a mere reaction to a disowned part of my own shadow. Her need to be seen was my need to be seen. Her attention-grabbing behavior was mine too. 
We were both recovering alcoholics looking for approval and at the same time healthy, sober women proud of our recovery. Her darkness and her light were a reflection of my own. When I was able to recognize myself in her, all boundaries dissolved into oneness. This experience was a great universal lesson in releasing judgment. What you judge in others is a reflection of what you judge in yourself, whereas what you love in others is a reflection of your light. As Yogi Bhajan said, recognize the other person is you. This experience was a huge universal lesson in releasing separation. My hope is that I no longer have to go this far to remember oneness. I hope I can become more mindful of my judgmental behavior and set myself free. To truly reap the benefits of this practice, you must be open to releasing judgment in every area of your life. You can't let go of judgment except for your boss or your mother-in-law or yourself. You must surrender it all. In some areas of life, it will feel easy to let it go. In others, you'll hold on tightly. Don't worry. This is natural. Freedom from judgment can offer you so much of what you desire. Physical pain can subside, you'll experience emotional and spiritual healing, and a deep connection to the universe will be restored. A Course in Miracles says, you have no idea of the great release and peace you will feel when you totally give up judgment. Therefore, releasing judgment is crucial if you want to be happy and free. My four-step process will show you the way. When you commit to following the process and become willing to let go of judgment, all of it will begin to dissolve. Universal Lesson You must be willing to shed old patterns and embrace a new way of being. The lessons in the earlier chapters have prepared you for these steps. You've begun to clear the space to perceive your life with more love and deepen your connection to the universe. Releasing judgment will guide you even closer to that connection. Take a moment to access the place within that led you to pick up this book. You were guided here through your conscious or unconscious desire to feel free to feel happy, and to reconnect with your true nature. Let that fierce desire support this process so that you can fully commit to the steps ahead. Follow this process and clear the tension, negativity, and stress that are blocking positive flow in your life. Step one, witness your judgment without judgment. By this point in the book, you are aware that the way you feel either blocks or attracts love into your life. When I started to witness how my judgmental nature made me feel, I could easily identify why my life wasn't flowing. Judgment made me feel weak, sad, and disconnected. It even caused me physical pain. The moment I was able to step away from the judgment and witness how it made me feel, I was able to truly understand how much it was blocking my connection to the universe. A friend was distraught because she could no longer feel her connection to the universe or her intuition. In response to her concern, I asked her to rate her daily level of judgment on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the highest. She thought honestly for a moment and said, You know, Gab, I never realized this before, but my judgment levels are at a 9. It feels really terrible to be disconnected from others and myself. Her honest inventory helped her see that it was judgment that was keeping her held back and stuck. Witnessing her judgment was the first step toward changing the pattern. In most cases, we don't even realize how judgmental we are. The way out of judgment begins when you witness the judgment without more judgment. Be mindful that when you take an honest inventory of your judgment, you may be tempted to criticize yourself for it or to feel shame for your thoughts and behavior. Instead, take a moment to honor yourself for having the willingness to look with love at whatever choices you've made. So let's do an inventory of how judgmental you are. Take a moment to rate your daily level of judgment from 0 to 10, 10 being the highest. Get honest with yourself about how judgmental you are. The best way to measure your level of judgment is to check into how it makes you feel. The more uncomfortable you feel when you think a judgmental thought, the higher the rating. Rate your judgment level now. Next, write down how your judgmental nature makes you feel. Review your notes. Do you see how judgment blocks your loving decisions? Can you feel how it holds you in a place of negativity and makes you believe that you are separate from others? Taking a closer look at the way judgment brings you down will strengthen your desire to rise up. In contrast, love accepts. Whenever you notice yourself caught up in judgment or attack, remember that you chose to see it from a sense of separation and fear. Once you've accepted that you made that choice, the only important thing is to choose again. Ask yourself, 
Do I look through the eyes of love or the eyes of judgment? Accept that you chose the teacher of fear over the teacher of love. Be mindful not to judge your fear with more fear. Don't get upset with yourself for making this choice. Instead, celebrate the fact that you recognize the misguided choice you made and that you're on the pathway to freedom. Step two, forgive the thought. Let yourself off the hook for the judgment that you made. The Course says, every communication is either an extension of love or a call for love. When you attack with judgment, you're really just looking for love. The search for love is your true intent behind the attack because deep down, all you want is to protect yourself from not feeling loved. It's also the intent of the person you believe has attacked you. Both of you are simply looking for love. At its core, attack is a call for help. The Course says, love always answers, being unable to deny a call for help or not to hear the cries of pain that rise to it from every part of this strange world you made but do not want. I want to reiterate this point. Attack, pain, fear, judgment, and any form of separation are merely calls for help. When you're in physical pain, you know that your pain calls for relief. The same goes for judgment. It's a form of emotional pain that you want to relieve. Whether you realize it or not, you do not want to remain sick, sad, and fearful. You want to be free. Witness your judgment without judgment. Accept that you have chosen fear and be open to receive the help you're calling for. This brings us to forgiveness. In any given moment that you witness yourself in judgment, you can become free by simply forgiving the thought. Forgive yourself for having the thought and even forgive the thought altogether. Recognize that the thought did not come from your highest self. Honor your judgmental self and remember that you're merely looking for love. Then as quickly as possible, choose to forgive the thought. You don't need to hold on to the thought. You don't need to replay it. You can forgive it in an instant. This simple desire seamlessly leads you into the holy instant. Welcome the holy instant with a prayer. I recognize that I have chosen wrongly. I forgive this thought and I choose again. I choose love. The presence of fear is your resistance to love. The way back to love is through surrendering to the holy instant. The instant you choose love over fear, you rise above illusion and separation and realign instead with oneness. Simply saying this prayer may offer you immediate relief. Step 3. See for the first time. We judge others and ourselves through the lens of our past by projecting old experiences onto our current circumstances. This is no different than judging the world through the lens of fear. If, for instance, you had an authority issue with your mother growing up, you may project that same issue today onto your boss by resenting her authority. We begin to heal our judgment toward others when we accept that people are our teachers in the classroom that is our life. Making that commitment allows us to look differently on our situations. Witness how we drag the past into the current moment and then choose again. We can choose to look at a person or situation as if we are seeing it for the first time. Imagine how free you would be if you didn't bring your past with you into your relationships or into each encounter. Practice saying this prayer before every encounter that triggers the shadow from your past. I want to see this person for the first time. When you practice seeing someone for the first time, you release them from the false projections you've placed on them and the beliefs that separate you. Instead of seeing others through the lens of the past, see them as someone calling out for love. Remember that you're both caught in the same cycle of fear and you're both desperately seeking a way out. That way is through love. When spiritual teachers talk of mankind being one, the oneness to which they refer is our one desire to be happy and free. We all share the same desire and the same fear. If more of us began to choose love, then oneness would be restored. It starts with you. You have a major part in the healing of the world. The more oneness you create in your life, the more light you shine on everyone around you. I believe this is our biggest mission here on earth, to choose love, restore oneness, and shine our light. This brings us to the final step, a meditation for oneness. Step four. Meditation for Oneness. To close out the judgment clearing process, follow this beautiful Kundalini meditation. This meditation is designed to remind us that we all have a shared essence that is beyond our physical sight. 
Practice this meditation and reconnect to the essence to experience oneness in this moment. Let's practice the meditation now. Sit comfortably cross-legged on the floor with a straight spine. Place your right fist at your side with the index finger pointing up and place the left hand over the heart center. You can also do this meditation sitting back to back with a partner. Focus your eyes on the brow point. I recommend that you play the song I Am Thine by Jai Jagdish. You can access the music at gabbybernstein.com forward slash universe. The mantra is Hummy Hum Tumi Tum Wahe Guru. I am thine in mine myself. Wahe Guru. This meditation celebrates the connection we have to others through our shared connection to the universe. Hummy Hum tunes us into our own consciousness. Tumi Tum accepts that we are one with the other person's consciousness. Wahe Guru means that we are both connected to the universe. Then we chant, I am thine in mine, to project our consciousness of our personal self to the infinite self. Then the world confirms that we are one with the universe. Finally, we celebrate this universal connection with Wahe Guru. Chant with the music for 11 minutes or less. If you're new to chanting mantras, give it a try. I fell in love with Kundalini Yoga and meditation because of the mantras. I lose myself in the mantra, and I remember my interconnectedness with the universe. I chose this specific Kundalini meditation to conclude the judgment clearing process so that you can have an intimate experience of what it truly feels like to release the walls of separation and realign with the oneness in your relationships. Practice these four steps and stick around for the miracles. Freedom is available to you instantly. It will continue to unfold as you stay committed to releasing judgment. Remember that judgment is a nasty habit. The more you practice these principles, the weaker the habit will be and the more freedom you will experience. I recently had a wonderful experience putting my four-step process into practice. It was at an 11-day spiritual retreat in San Diego. When the course was complete, I felt awesome and super connected to the universe. But then I arrived at the airport to return home and saw that my flight was delayed three hours. It didn't even phase me because I was still in a high vibe zone from all the meditating and spiritual lessons I'd practiced that week. I sat down to read and relax while I patiently waited out my delay. An hour later, it was announced that the flight had been delayed 12 more hours. My noon flight would now be leaving at midnight, which meant I'd have to take a red eye back to New York. Even though I hate red eyes and airports in general, I maintained my calm and surrendered to the change in plans. I had ate my flight. The attendant replied with a negative attitude and brushed me off as if I was wasting her time. Immediately, this sent me into an ego separation, a.k.a. diva mode. I jumped into judgment and began thinking thoughts like, how dare you treat me like this? Separation, judgment, and attack set in. To avoid making a scene, I walked away to grab dinner. An hour later, I returned to the gate to get the update on the flight. By this time, I'd been in the airport for more than seven hours, and I had several more hours to go. I was doing my best to maintain my Zen attitude, and I peacefully walked up to the desk to ask the attendant for guidance. There were two new flight attendants standing at the desk, but as I walked up, the rude attendant from earlier stepped in. She looked at me with an attitude of disgust and said, What do you want now? This sent me into a tizzy. I looked at her and said, you know I've been here for seven hours and my flight has been delayed for 12. You know I'm exhausted and I'm desperate to get home. The least you could do is be polite. She went on to assert her authority and tell me that I had been asking too many questions and I needed to calm down. At this point, I got a serious attitude and replied, I'm one of this airline's best customers. I would hope that you could be kinder given my 12-hour delay. She wasn't interested in my response or my nasty tone. At that point, I stormed off. Raising my voice and fighting back did not feel good. The moment I walked away from the desk, I burst into tears. I felt defeated, exhausted, and sad. I sat down for a moment and tapped into my body. I asked myself why I felt so sad. Was it because I didn't get my way? Because I was disrespected? No. I felt this way because I succumbed to the ego sense of separation. I let judgment take the lead. This moment of recognition and my willingness to see my part in the situation was the first step in clearing the aftermath of my judgment outbreak. The second step was my acknowledgement of how this judgment made me feel, disappointed, physically ill, and saddened. 
I was ready to move into the third step of letting go of the shadows of the past. In that moment, I decided to see the airline attendant as if I was meeting her for the first time. I chose to see her with no separation. Rather than perceiving her as separate, I chose to see her as one with me. Once again, I heard the words of Yogi Bhajan ringing in my ear, Recognize the other person is you. Recognize the other person is you. For further guidance, I called on the holy instant for support. I said my prayer. I recognize that I have chosen wrongly. I forgive this thought and I choose again. I choose love. Instantly, I felt better. I guess that's why they call it the holy instant. I sat in the meditation, listened to my mantra, and allowed the presence of love to settle back in. A glowing sense of peace passed over me. I no longer felt resentment and instead felt a deep connection. I heard the voice of my inner wisdom say, She is you. Her pain is yours. Her suffering is yours. And you both want the same thing, to return to peace. I came out of my meditation and the judgment had lifted. I could see her as me and I was free. At this point, I calmly read my book and relaxed. A little while later, when I walked past the front desk where she sat, I felt a presence behind my shoulders slow me down. Without thought or planning, I stood in front of the desk, looked her in the eye, and said, I apologize for speaking to you that way. It was inappropriate, and I hope you can forgive me. She smiled with joy and replied, I'm sorry you're having such a hard day, and please let me know how I can make it better. This was a miracle moment. I left the airport that night exhausted, hungry, and a little closer to God. This practice of releasing judgment dissolves all boundaries with love. It brings us back to the truth that we're all in it together. We all suffer. We all feel unworthy and abandoned. Calling on the holy instant allows us to remember that we are all the same, and so we should be kind to one another. Identifying this sameness is what allows us to shift our focus from separation to love. The same way we share the thought system of fear, we also share the loving mind. Most important, we share the same capacity to choose love over fear. As my dear teacher, Kenneth Wapnick said, we see that we all have the same interest of awakening from the dream of unkindness and returning to the kindness who created us kind. Let's recap the four steps. Be willing to release judgment and accept that you have chosen fear. Forgive the judgmental thought with this prayer. I recognize that I have chosen fear and I choose again. I choose love. Let go of the shadow of the past by seeing someone for the first time with the eyes of love. Practice the kundalini meditation and recognize the other person is you. This four-step process can set you free one moment at a time. Each time we release judgment and return to love, we experience a miracle. When we add up these miracle moments, we get more deeply aligned with our true nature and the support of the universe. Whenever you practice clearing judgment, a loving answer and solution will come through for you. As the Course says, all the angels in heaven will come to your aid. Let love guide everything you say and do. In Chapter 10, I guide you to see how your conscious connection to love can clear the path for peace and harmony. Chapter 10, You Are the Universe I once spent a week in a training course with my friend and teacher Deepak Chopra. The first day of the training, Deepak told us to pair up with a partner and then ask each other a series of questions. My partner was a young woman named Elsa. During the exercise, one partner was asked to whisper a question again and again in the other person's ear, and their partner was meant to respond with whatever thoughts jumped into their mind. We began the exercise with the question, Who are you? Slowly, Elsa began to whisper in my ear, Who are you? And my response was, I am Gabrielle Bernstein. She went on, Who are you? I replied, I am Gabby. She repeated this question a few more times, and I continued to respond with answers that described me, my personality, and who I perceived myself to be in the world. Then Elsa moved on to the next question. What do you want? I replied, I want a snack. She continued, what do you want? I replied, I want a nap. This ridiculous Q&A went on. What do you want? I want a full night's sleep. What do you want? I want a coffee. What do you want? Did I say I want a nap? 
After several rounds of questioning, we ended the exercise and went back to our seats. I remember feeling terrible afterwards. I thought, I'm at a spiritual retreat and all I can think about is when I can get a snack? I didn't have much time to lament my poor performance during the exercise because Deepak immediately led us into a group meditation. He guided us to repeat a mantra and release any attachments we had to the previous exercises. Within a few minutes, I began to feel relief. Then I slipped into a silent place of stillness in between the thoughts. The space where nothing matters. The space where I feel free. I relaxed into the stillness and let go of all the pretenses I'd built up around myself. In that moment, I was one with the universe. Suddenly, a loud inner voice spoke up and said, I am one with the universe, and I want to get closer to consciousness. I had realigned with the energy of the universe long enough to remember my true nature. I came out of my meditation remembering that I am one with the universe, and I want to get closer to that truth. This involuntary response instantly brought me to tears. In the presence of truth, all fear disappeared, all separation released, and all judgment dissolved. In that instant, I was free. Later that week, during my training with Deepak, I had the opportunity to sit down with him for a private conversation. I told him about all the spiritual quests I'd been on, all the paths I had chosen, and all that I had believed to be true. I said, is it okay that I've followed A Course in Miracles, Kundalini Yoga, John of God, and many other spiritual thought systems? Is it okay that I haven't committed to one specific path? He replied, of course it's okay. You do whatever it takes to get closer to consciousness. Deepak was right. Our work is to do whatever it takes to get closer to consciousness, and each of us does it in our own unique way. Every exercise in this book has been a gentle guide bringing you closer to consciousness to remind you of who you truly are. You are the loving energy of the universe. This truth can blindside us when we least expect it, in fleeting moments on our meditation pillow or in an instant when we choose to release judgment and forgive. Wouldn't it be nice to feel that connection more often? Our connection to love is often just a whisper amid the noisy chaos of our mind. Fear and separation are a pattern that must be interrupted on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. When we fully commit to shift the pattern through prayer and meditation, we begin to rely on love more than fear. Love becomes our default, and we can redirect our thoughts and energy quickly to return to our truth. This book has offered you a pathway toward releasing the falseness of the world and remembering the truth, which is love. Don't judge your path. Don't try to be perfect. Just focus on your commitment to tuning into the frequency of the universe. Universal Lesson you are one with the universe. The way to knowing your truth is to allow the voice of love to echo through every single thought you have. Even when you detour into fear, which you will do all day long, commit to the voice of love the moment you witness that you've chosen wrongly. Don't tolerate the fearful wanderings of your mind any longer. Make love your priority. Think about how different your life would be if you were fully committed to love throughout the day. Imagine waking up in the morning and instead of turning on the news, over-caffeinating and checking your phone, you began the day with a devotion, a prayer, a meditative moment. My teacher Marianne Williamson says, when we give time to a quieting experience, we have a different life because we have a different nervous system. Tuning into the love of the universe lowers our stress levels, restores our cells, and reorganizes our energy. Conscious contact with love interrupts the pattern of fear and returns us to our true nature. Although this book may seem as if it contains many lessons and exercises, there's really only one. Choose love. Each practice brings you closer to it. Each prayer, meditation, and exercise helps you shift your focus away from perceiving yourself as separate from the love of the universe. The Course teaches, fear can never enter in a mind that has attached itself to love. Each time you shift your focus back to love, you release your sense of separation and realign. When you're in alignment with the love of the universe, peace cannot be disrupted. No person, situation, or circumstance can take away your peace of mind. This isn't an easy concept to grasp because we believe so deeply in fear and separation. We believe we can be harmed and we protect ourselves at all costs. At the level of the mind, we can never be harmed because in any moment we can choose love. The more we stay committed to love, the more we believe in it. I can say this with conviction. 
I have committed my life to unlearning fear and releasing my separate perceptions of myself. Each new day offers me great spiritual assignments that when faced with prayer and devotion bring me closer to consciousness. Even in this moment as I read these words, I'm reinforcing that connection. We are all connected in that we have the same problem and the same solution. Our problem is that we detoured into fear and believed we are separate and unsafe in this world. While we may have this problem, we also have the same solution. The solution lies in the decision-making part of our mind that chooses love. It doesn't matter where you are on your spiritual journey. Whether you're a long-time spirit junkie or a first-time reader, you can accept this truth now. You are one with the love of the universe. Our spiritual path leads us to spiritual sight. This is when we begin to relinquish our faith in our perceptions of the world to see strength rather than weakness, oneness rather than separation, and love rather than fear. At the beginning of this book, the voice of love was probably distant and hard to hear. But the more you lean toward love, the more you begin to see with spiritual sight, listen with the voice of love, and live more joyously and free. This is what it means to release your perception of separateness and accept you are one with the universe. Stringing together those moments of true connection is how we begin to see the world through the lens of love rather than the lens of fear. Even when situations baffle us, we have the power to quickly return to love. Now is the time to crank up the volume on your truth and turn down the volume on the voice of fear and separation. So choose it. Fully surrender to your spiritual nature, your purpose, your passion, and a deep connection to the universe. By this point in your practice, you're ready to embrace your true connection. These steps are designed to deepen your faith that you are one with the love of the universe. Step 1. A Prayer for Truth Prayer is the pathway to love. This prayer acts as an intermediary between your feelings of separation and your truth. Use this prayer as an invisible guide back to love. Let each word sink into your psyche. Recite this prayer out loud to yourself. A prayer for truth. I call on the energy of the universe to guide my thoughts back to love. I surrender the false perceptions I have placed upon myself. I forgive these thoughts and I know that I am love. I am peace. I am compassion. I am the universe. Following the prayer, Settle back into the energy of love through the following meditation. Step 2. Meditation to connect to the universe. You can open up your heart to love through this beautiful kundalini meditation. This meditation will foster a deep emotional and physical connection to the universe. Kundalini is the yoga of awareness. I'm a student and teacher of kundalini yoga because the meditations and practices instantly bring me closer to consciousness. This kundalini meditation will move stagnant energy and get you directly aligned with the universe. The posture in the meditation opens your heart to reconnect you to your true nature and oneness with the universe. I recommend practicing this meditation with the song Hallelujah, found at gabbybernstein.com forward slash universe. Old Gypsy Way of Calling on the Spirit of Mother Earth, originally taught by Yogi Bhajan on July 4th, 1994. This meditation is meant to help you invoke the loving spirit of the universe. Sit comfortably cross-legged on the floor with a straight spine and a straight neck. Raise your arms up 60 degrees from horizontal, elbows and wrists straight. Stretch the body forward slightly from the plane of the body. The angle of the palms follow the angle of the arms. The fingers are straight and together, thumbs relaxed. A picture is available of this posture at gabbybernstein.com forward slash universe. Stay still and imagine a flame at the heart center. Breathe consciously, long, and deep. Sit in this meditation for three minutes. To end the meditation, inhale deeply. Hold your breath for 15 seconds. Exhale. Inhale deeply. Feel in your connection to the universe. Hold your breath for 15 seconds. Exhale. Inhale deep. Feel the taste of the sweetness of life. Hold for 15 seconds. Exhale. Following this meditation, lie on your back and rest for several minutes. This is called Savasana. 
I believe that Shavasana is the most important pose because it's where we can relax into the energy of love. Take your time to lie on your back with your palms facing upward and allow the presence of light and love to pour through you. It's possible that you may feel a tingling sensation in your palms given the activation of your hands in the meditation. Let the loving flow of energy pass over your body and relax into Savasana. In these moments of genuine release, you can reorganize your nervous system and realign your connection to love. Step 3. Truth is your name. After several minutes of rest, slowly bring your awareness back to your body. Roll your wrists and ankles in circles and gently come to a seated position. In this seated position, continue to feel your connection to the universe. When you're seated, take a deep breath in and say out loud, Sat Nam. Closing a practice with this Kundalini mantra identifies your truth. Sat means truth. Nam means name. The mantra is translated as truth is my name. It is simply an acknowledgement that the magnificence of the universe is the truth of who you are. Following this practice, you may feel a deeper sense of interconnectedness. If even for a fleeting moment you felt free, then you're one moment closer to consciousness. Yogi Bhajan said, In the flow of deep meditation, my nectar thoughts are filled with God. Practice this meditation often, and in time your connection to the universe will become more present in your life. You may even want to practice it for 40 days straight. This meditation has the power to offer you a direct line back to your spiritual nature. It can remind you that you are the light of the universe. In any given moment, you can remember your truth by returning to your mantra, Sat Nam, or the translation, Truth is my name. To remain happy and free, we must be in communion with our truthful connection as often as possible. This gentle reminder will bring you back home. Practice repeating the mantra Sat Nam whenever you're out of alignment with the universe. The vibration of the mantra Sat Nam manifests truth into your physical experience. The vibration of Sat reaches up to the ether, calling on your connection to the universe. Nam is a grounding vibration that acknowledges that you can bring the energy of the universe into your day-to-day -day experience of the world. Bring forth your truth in every corner of your life. Bring peace with you wherever you go. Step four, walk the path of humility. To truly flourish on your spiritual path, you must embody humility. Knowing that you're one with the universe means that you accept that you're not more special than or separate from others. This may be one of the most challenging spiritual assignments as we've grown to believe in the stories of who we think we are. Humility doesn't come easily. At least it didn't for me. While I spent many years deeply committed to my spiritual path, I was equally committed to the outward pretenses I'd built up around myself. Deep down I knew that this ego perception was blocking my connection to love, but it wasn't an easy habit to kick. Thankfully the universe presented me with a divine assignment that forced me to seek humility, shed my ego, and get right-sized. Here's how it happened. Not long ago I was left out of an event organized by a prominent teacher in my field that featured a few of my contemporaries. The fact that I wasn't asked to participate seriously bruised my ego. And while I wouldn't admit it to anyone, I was really upset by what I considered a missed opportunity. I asked my publicist to look into it and find out why I was left off the roster. After a little digging, she called me and said, Gab, this is a little strange. When I asked them why they didn't consider you, the women in charge of the event looked at each other silently for a second and then responded that they felt you were self-entitled. I responded with a defensive tone. Why would they think that? I never did anything wrong. She replied, they said it was the vibe they got from you. I sat with this issue for several hours and allowed myself to move through the emotions of frustration and anger. I was defensive, embarrassed, and confused. I couldn't understand what I'd done to make them think that. After processing my feelings, I chose to seek a spiritual solution. I asked the universe to show me my assignment. Through deep contemplation and an honest inventory of my behavior, I looked closely at my part in the situation. Even though I thought I'd done nothing wrong, I remembered that our vibes speak louder than our words. I got really honest about the ways that I perceived myself as special and separate. I got honest about my lack of humility. 
I came to realize how this extremely uncomfortable situation was the perfect assignment to bring me to my knees and surrender to humility once and for all. Humbly surrendering was the only way I was going to see the shadow that needed to be brought to the light. I called on a message from my great A Course in Miracles teacher, Kenneth Wapnick. We should be grateful for all situations that make us the most uncomfortable, because without them, we would not know there is something unhealed in us. I allow this discomfort to lead me back to my truth. This universal assignment helped me commit to the path of humility. I could no longer try to dance between spiritual humility and my worldly ego. It was time to surrender it all and accept my purpose, to be love and spread love. Without humility, I would never know what it truly meant to be one with the universe. Now I devote each day to humbly surrendering to the care of the universe. In my morning prayers, I turn over my perceptions of myself, I release my needs and expectations, and I allow the universe to take over. This daily devotion keeps me connected to who I really am. Walking the path of humility doesn't mean that you give up on greatness. In fact, it means that you embrace your true magnitude and power, the power that lies in your devoted connection to love. Truly accepting your love nature requires you to relinquish all the stories and pretenses you've created about yourself. It's challenging, but trust that even a brief moment of connection is enough. Many folks who begin to open up to metaphysical truths get scared about giving up the ideas of the world and connecting to love. That feeling is not your truth. It's the voice of fear trying to stay alive. Your faith and fear will make you resist your connection to love in order to keep you in the perception that you're separate from the love of the universe. It's terrifying to let go of the beliefs you've held on to for your lifetime but your happiness and peace depend on releasing those ideas. This brings us back to where we began with our resistance to love. Remember that fear will resist love, especially when love becomes more present in your life. Simply be aware of your fearful resistance and commit to walking the humble path. Your human experience is part of your spiritual journey, so you don't have to walk through life expecting to live in divine connection all the time. Aim to string together many moments of consciousness to ultimately remember that you are the spirit of love having a human experience. Let's invite in a moment of consciousness now and give yourself permission to accept your magnitude. As a gentle reminder of how limitless you are, listen to this passage from A Course in Miracles. To use the power God has given you as he would have you use it is natural. It is not arrogant to be as he created you, but it is arrogant to lay aside the power he gave and choose a little senseless wish instead of what he wills. The gift of God to you is limitless. There is no circumstance it cannot answer and no problem which is not resolved within its gracious light. Each day, do your best to stay in communication with the universe. Spend time leaning toward the potential positive outcomes rather than all that you expect can go wrong. Turn to prayer when you're in doubt and meditate to deepen your connection. Whenever you find yourself caught up in conflict, choose to seek creative solutions. Your devotion to your practice will keep you in constant contact with the support of the universe. Your level of happiness and peace will be a direct reflection of your spiritual practice. Devoting your days to your inner life will bring you joy. Even though you may still deeply identify as a separate person having a unique experience, you can hold a small place in your consciousness for the truth. That belief is enough to keep you on the path. Let's recap the lessons from this chapter. Do whatever it takes to get closer to consciousness. Experience your interconnectedness. Practice the prayer for truth and the kundalini meditation to heighten your experiential connection with the universe. Remember that truth is your name. Practice the mantra Sat Nam to stay committed to your true nature. Walk a path of humility to stay centered in your universal truth. Remember the words of Deepak Chopra, do whatever it takes to get closer to consciousness. Stay consistent with your conscious contact to the universe and you will be set free. In chapter 11, you'll deepen that connection through the practice of surrender. Chapter 11. When you think you've surrendered, surrender more. Right around the time that I began writing this book, my husband and I also began trying to conceive. I had it all perfectly planned. 
My expectation was to get pregnant right away and then cut back on traveling so that I could relax at home while spending time working on the book and enjoying my pregnancy. I was very committed to this plan. I canceled speaking engagements, said no to big opportunities, and otherwise took things off my plate to free up my time to care for myself. My goals were set and the plan was airtight. But there was one problem. I didn't get pregnant. Month after month, I rearranged my goals and expectations to try to stay on course with my pregnancy plans. I'd tell all my friends that we were consciously conceiving, but it was really more like unconsciously controlling. While I felt strongly that I was meant to be a mother and I intuitively knew that there was a soul ready to become our child, I still couldn't release the plan. I became obsessed with the timing. Otherwise, how would I fit pregnancy and a child into my busy life? This future tripping got the best of me. Each month when I realized I wasn't pregnant, I'd go back to zero, break out my calendar, look nine months ahead, and stress out about the time, which I tried desperately to control so that this major life experience wouldn't be inconvenient. My need to control the plan totally cut off my communication with the universe. I silently judged myself for not getting pregnant, and I compared myself with everyone around me who was conceiving. Worst of all, I'd walk around telling everyone how much faith I had that I'd be a mother when deep down I was suppressing an unspeakable fear that it would never happen. About nine months into the process of trying to conceive, I went to a New Year's Eve party with friends from college. All the couples there had children except for my husband and me. I felt like an outsider, left out of this phase of life. I sat through dinner comparing myself to everyone at the table and feeling totally defeated. I woke up the next morning, New Year's Day, and got my period. Here I was again, another month gone by, countless plans reorganized, and still no baby. I spent the first half of the day deeply depressed. I felt caught in a shameful silence with no outlet. My friend Jordan was staying at my house, and somehow I found the courage to tell him how I was feeling. Within moments of sharing my feelings with him, he gently guided me to witness the ways that I'd let fear and the need to control block me from love. He reminded me that instead of comparing myself with friends with children, that I should celebrate them. In the celebration of their love, I would recognize it as my own. Our conversation helped me see how my fixed, rigid agenda had made me lose hope. After talking to Jordan, I turned to the love of the universe for healing. I prayed and asked for help in releasing my own plan and accepting a plan far greater. In the stillness following my prayer, I heard my inner voice say, your plans are in the way of God's plans. I could see clearly how I'd been blocking my higher plan. I accepted this message as a new universal assignment and embraced the spiritual growth that was presented to me. As humans, we love to set goals and make plans. It's a smart way to keep our minds organized and not let small daily snags throw us off kilter. But when we fixate too much on achieving our goals and sticking to our plans, we get in our own way. We become convinced that we know what's best. We relentlessly pursue the path of our ego, that loud and misguided voice. And we do it at the expense of cutting off communication with the universe. This behavior keeps us from manifesting what is of the highest good for all. In order to allow the presence of love to shine on every area of our lives, we must remember that hope never rests. Hope is the energy that carries us when we lose sight of our spiritual faith. Hope reminds us of the power of love and clears the path toward the highest good for all. Universal Lesson Goals Overshadow Guidance The part of me that wants to be in control doesn't like the word hope. To my fearful mind, hope implies that there's something I'm unable to make happen on my own. While I may not like that concept, it's exactly what I need. Hope helps us move through our problems and choose to perceive them in a new way. Hope is the conduit for miracles. For me to move past the sadness, shame, and need to control, I had to surrender to hope and let go of my plans. In this process, I was reminded of the need to turn inward for answers. Carl Jung said, Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. When we look outside for our faith, we get lost in the dreams of who we think we should be, what we think we need and when we think we need it. But when we turn inward, we surrender to the one and only truth, which is love. When we surrender to love, we can experience our darkest moments as the greatest catalyst for transformation. The pathway back to hope is through surrender. 
It's not something that comes naturally to us. It must be a daily practice. Consider my situation. Here I was in the midst of writing a book on how to trust the love of the universe, all the while trying to control my own circumstances. The need to control is sneaky. It can blindside us. The ego thinks it knows the way, and it does everything it can to keep us in a headlock. The best way, and ultimately the only way, to stay connected to the flow you've established is to surrender and then surrender some more. This is not to say that surrender is easy. I see people struggle with it all the time, especially around money. The fear of turning over your earning capacity to the care of the universe is terrifying for some of us. We worry that if we're not fully in control of our earnings, that we won't be able to pay the bills and life will spiral into chaos. But that controlling attitude blocks others from wanting to hire us, promote us, or buy our product. Surrendering our money to the universe doesn't mean that we don't go to work and take action. What it means is that we take action from a faithful state. We surrender our financial needs to the love of the universe while simultaneously showing up for work with faith and grace. Faith and grace, not controlling energy, clear the path to abundance. Another point of contention is relationships, romantic and otherwise. I witness people trying to control their partner's behaviors or manipulate a relationship. This doesn't necessarily mean they're conniving or uncaring, not at all. They just desperately want the relationship to look the way they decided it should. Controlling your relationships blocks love and deprives you of your spiritual lessons. But surrendering your relationships to the care of the universe invites love back in. When you let go and allow the universe to guide your relationships, it's like booking a session with an invisible therapist. The presence of love sets into the relationship naturally. Guidance comes in many forms, and your behavior changes. When you surrender your relationship to love, you're able to bring your highest self to the table. How about goals and scheduling? If you're anything like me, you really like to have a plan and stick to it. However, over planning blocks the natural order and puts a limit on what would otherwise be limitless possibilities. When you over plan, you limit your capacity to co-create with the universe. Rigidly sticking to a plan forces you to rely on your will, which cuts you off from the support and wisdom of the universe. In my case, my plan was blocking the sacred joy of making a baby. Releasing the timing and schedule was the only way for me to let love lead and clear space for my life to unfold with grace. I had to surrender my plans and expectations to the care of the universe and trust that love would lead the way. Surrendering to love is not always easy, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to live a miraculous life. You don't have to surrender fully overnight. In fact, it usually doesn't happen all at once. Surrender is a process. A Course in Miracles says, each small step will clear a little of the darkness away. Here are the steps I use to clear away the darkness of control and surrender to the love of the universe. Step one, take your hands off the steering wheel. In his book, The Seat of the Soul, Gary Zukav writes, take your hands off the steering wheel. Be able to say to the universe, thy will be done, and to know it within your intentions. Spend time in this thought. Consider what it means to say, Thy will be done, and allow your life to go into the hands of the universe completely. To restore your connection to the guidance of the universe, you must loosen your grip. When you surrender your plans and release control, you stop pursuing the path of your misguided ego. You allow the voice of your intuition and the energy of love to be your guide. The way you take your hands off the wheel is through prayer. If you're in need of surrender, begin each day with these words. Today I surrender my goals and plans to the care of the universe. I offer up my agenda and accept spiritual guidance. I trust that there is a plan far greater than mine. I know that where there once was lack and limitation, there are spiritual solutions and creative ideas. I step back and let love lead the way. Thy will be done. These words will help you humbly surrender to the guidance of the universe. Something miraculous happens when you let go and allow. You open up to an infinite field of possibilities. The moment I surrendered my desire to be a mother, I felt taken care of. I knew that the universe was guiding me in the perfect direction, time, and order. Trusting the path of the universe gave me freedom and happiness in the midst of uncertainty. 
Step 2. Turnover time. The biggest block to living with faith is time. There are many situations in our lives that we cannot control. You can't decide the exact day you'll conceive, the moment your lover will propose, or a million other things. But you can control how you experience each moment of each day. The way to surrender your need to control time is to embrace the present moment. In any moment, you can receive a miracle with the decision to choose love. That simple choice, to choose love over fear, can release you of time and restore your hope and faith. Love is a decision, and all that is asked of you is the willingness to choose it. Each time you do is a miracle, and with total willingness, your obsession with time will end. The miracle is now. A Course in Miracles Lesson 173 is, The Light Has Come. I once had a deep conversation with my friend and mentor, Robert Holden. We both have a shared love for this lesson. For Robert, it's a gentle reminder that the light isn't coming when you get the job or the baby is born. The light has come. It's already here. In any given moment, you can surrender to the light and live in the miracle. To give up your obsession with time, we must accept that the light has come. We already embody all the love, joy, and peace we long for. In any moment, when you find yourself caught up in time, you can return to the miracle of the moment. Accept that the light has come and live in the miracle. Imagine how free you would feel if you lived your life moment to moment rather than milestone to milestone. When you turn over time, you can trust in the order of the universe. You have faith that everything is happening to you in the perfect time so that you can grow and heal. Embrace the miracle available in every moment, and each step will be perfectly laid out before you. Don't rush your spiritual evolution. Enjoy it. It's the journey that matters, not the destination. Step 3. Surrender your goals and let faith take the lead. We must learn to give up goals and embrace hope and faith. Goals often imply that you need to achieve something else to be happy. Remember, there's nothing wrong with visions, dreams, and desires as long as you're willing to surrender them. The key is to gently hold great visions and then release them to the universe. To feel free and surrendered, we must learn to release our attachments. Deepak Chopra says, when you're happy for some reason, you're still in misery because that reason can be taken away from you tomorrow. Instead of seeking some reason or outcome to make us happy, we must learn to trust in the wonders of the universe. Each day brings new miracles to celebrate. Each moment can be a miracle if we choose to perceive it that way. Instead of focusing on goals and outcomes, redirect your focus onto celebrating what you already have. Take time each day to devote your attention to what is thriving in your life. In my case, I gave up the goal of getting pregnant on a specific date and chose instead to focus on the deep love I have for my husband. I made it my intention to feel connected and in love. I redirected my energy onto my body and the health I am blessed to enjoy. I concentrated on my home and the space I am creating for the baby I am ready to call into my life. Instead of focusing on when I will have something or someone new, I focused on what I already have. When you return your focus to what you already embody and enjoy in your life, you can let go of what you think you need. That doesn't mean that you cut off your desire. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You bring far more love and energy to your desire when you take the pressure off. Focusing on what you do have creates more of what you want. Step four, turn it over to the Holy Triangle. A beautiful element of my spiritual practice is my holy triangle. It's a wooden triangle that hangs above my altar. Each edge of the triangle has a meaning, faith, love, and charity. The triangle is a symbol used in the John of God community to facilitate spiritual surrender. The idea is that when you write down your desire and place it in the holy triangle, the desire will be taken care of. You leave your desire in the triangle for a week. And then at the end of the week, you remove the piece of paper and burn it. The act of burning the paper symbolizes your faith and trust that your desire is being supported. I burn my paper over the kitchen sink. If you don't want to burn it, you can flush it down the toilet. When I was wrapping up this chapter, I realized that I hadn't placed my desire to be a mother into the Holy Triangle. 
All this time I'd been so controlling that I'd forgotten this crucial step. Placing my desire into the triangle allowed me to tell the universe that I know it's being handled. You too can have a holy triangle. You can make one, or if that isn't you, simply use a box. I've taught many people to create their own God box, and it offers the same service as the triangle. You can decorate the box in any way that empowers you. Once you have the triangle or box, try it out. Write down your desire and place it in the hands of the universe. At the end of one week, take it out and burn it. Be sure to burn it safely in the sink. That's all it takes. As you continue on with this practice, be mindful not to put the same desire back in the box. That would imply that you didn't trust it was being taken care of. This is a powerful practice of surrendering. Practice these four steps and then offer up your desire to the holy triangle or box. Place your desire in your triangle and say a silent prayer to surrender it to the universe. Turn it over once and for all and know your request is being heard. These four steps will greatly help you surrender what you think you need and embrace what is of the highest good for all. Focus on the subtle, moment-to-moment -moment shifts. As A Course in Miracles reminds us, each small step will clear a little of the darkness away. You may be wondering how you'll know when you've truly surrendered. You know you've surrendered when you trust that the universe has a better plan than you do. You've surrendered when you no longer manipulate and force outcomes. You've surrendered when you let go of the need to be in charge of your life. You've surrendered when you let go of the need to be in charge of your life and let the universe get to work instead. Finally, you know you've surrendered when you don't defend your need to control. Follow this path and surrender your goals. Here's the recap of the steps to surrender. Take your hands off the wheel through prayer. Turn over time by accepting the present moment as a miracle. Surrender your goals and let faith take the lead. Release your desire to your God box or holy triangle. Trust it is being taken care of. These steps will clear even more space for the universe to serve as your guide. Once again, I'm reminded of the wisdom of A Course in Miracles. There is a way of living that is not here, though it seems to be. You do not change appearance, but you smile more frequently. Your forehead is soft and your eyes are serene. Surrender offers you this kind of serenity. When you practice surrender, you'll begin to lean on a power greater than you. In time, you'll know it's always there and you'll rely on it. Chapter 12, Be an Instrument for Love. One morning, I was sitting in my kitchen at the mountain house having breakfast with my husband. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw three men approaching from the driveway. They were dressed in all black with hoods covering their heads and each carried something long and black. I went into complete terror and started planning ways to run and escape. I was almost paralyzed with fear, for in that moment, I was convinced that these three menacing-looking men were walking toward us carrying large guns. As the men neared the house, the reality of the situation presented itself. These were not murderers coming to get me, but the nice guys who cut the yard walking around with their leaf blowers. While this may seem funny, it was actually terribly upsetting. What upset me most was that because of the gun violence in my country, I instantly assumed the worst. Because of the gun control issues in the United States, I walk through life with an unconscious fear that at any moment someone will show up with a gun. This is a real fear that many people can relate to. Later that week, there was news about yet another mass shooting in California, and the statistics presented by the news media were staggering. There have been mass shootings every day since the Sandy Hook tragedy. Our chances of being killed by another American with a gun far outweigh any chance of being killed in a terrorist attack. As I watched the news report, I started to get very angry. I began to feel a strong need to fight back, speak up, and be heard. So I took my rage and anger to the Internet. I posted a picture of a gun with a band sign across it. The comment said, Sending prayers to our country, this has to stop. Within minutes, there were hundreds of comments. To my surprise, there were women on my page defending their guns. There were comments like, I'm disappointed in you, Gabby. I need my gun to protect my family. These comments sent me into rage. 
I started preaching to my husband about how insane I thought these responses were, and that the need for guns as protection only perpetuated the problem. I said to my husband, I'm going to post again. Then my husband responded with some necessary wisdom. How's that going to help? He asked. Your negative post is only going to fuel the fire. Aren't you all about facing adversity with love? In that moment, my husband was my guru. Zach has always been a powerful mirror for me to see my shadow and bring it to the light. Sometimes it's the people closest to us who can reflect back our greatest learning opportunities for spiritual growth. I smiled and said, You're right. I cannot defend against this fear with anger. I must be an instrument for love. I refrained from defending, commenting, or deleting the negative comments. Instead, I sat with my feelings and called on love. I recognized myself in the angry mothers on my Facebook page. Their need for guns arose from the same sense of fear I had. After all, we are all scared of violence and have the deep desire to protect our families. With compassion, I could see their opinions with love. Gun violence is one of the many horrific issues we're currently facing as a nation. How do we find safety in the midst of uncertainty? How do we find power when we feel so powerless? How do we find peace when there is so much fear? The answer is to lead from a place of love. Our capacity to tune into the energy of love gives us the words we need when we're ready to speak up, the compassion we need when it's time to forgive, and the power we need when we are lost. As a spiritual activist, I believe that the greatest power we have to combat the terror of these times is our power to live in love. Love casts out all fear. Every chapter of this book has been leading you to this point. You now know how powerful you truly are. You know that you have the capacity to connect to the force of the universe to influence others with your presence. You know your power lies in your capacity to be love and spread light. The more love you bring to the world, the more you will inspire others to live in love. Then they will do the same. This ripple effect of love is what changes patterns, creates peaceful revolutions, and ends wars. You may feel that your power is lost in the hands of some insane CEO, terrorist, or fear-based world leader. It's not. Your power lies in your capacity to spread love. It may be hard to grasp the idea that spreading love can abolish terrorism, reduce gun violence, heal the environment, feed the hungry, free the enslaved, and so on. I get it. I too feel defeated, powerless, and lost a lot of the time. But in the moments when I remember my power lies in my capacity to spread love, I regain my strength, certainty, and peace. We absolutely must commit to this truth in order to save the world. We change the world when we shift spiritually, when our attitudes become more loving, when we forgive, when we heal our wounds from the past, and when we embrace the present moment. The miracles that occur on an individual level have a massive impact on the collective field of energy. One person's shift toward love shines light onto all. I write these books to have an impact on your life so that you can have an impact on the world. As each individual lights up his or her life, the world becomes brighter. In our light, the darkness cannot coexist. When I was in the process of writing this book, I told my literary mentor what it was about. I said, this book is about helping people find safety in the midst of uncertainty, power when they feel powerless, and love in a fearful world. He replied, that's lovely and powerful, but books about saving the world don't sell. As a marketer, I totally understood where he was coming from. But as a woman living during these difficult times, I was unwilling to give up my intention. While I want all my readers to learn how to manifest their desires, thrive in their careers, and enjoy wildly incredible relationships, what I want most from you is to be the light. My commitment in this lifetime is to wake up as many people as possible to their power to lead from a place of love. I perceive myself as a can opener who is here to crack you open to your highest potential to serve the world with your joy. I am deeply devoted to waking you up to your true purpose. Be love and spread love. Our lives depend on it. 
These words can no longer be cute buzz phrases that we post on Instagram. These words must be our mission. The safety and security we long for lie in our commitment to love. The final steps of this book will guide you to embrace your capacity to join me as a spiritual activist. This work will remind you that your connection to the universe must be used for the highest purpose, to save the world. Follow these steps and accept my invitation. Join me in being the light. Step 1. Wake up. I have the privilege of witnessing thousands of people embrace their spiritual natures. It's incredible to see people wake up to their connection to love. But far too often, I also see that these spiritually conscious people are extremely unconscious about what's going on in the world. Or maybe they're aware because they watch the news and read the paper, but they're apathetic to the issues. There's nothing more upsetting to me than highly spiritual people who are disengaged from the world around them. While I do not recommend getting sucked into the dramas of the news, I feel it is our responsibility to consciously wake up to what's going on around us. If we ignore what's happening, we'll fall into the trap of apathy and forget the importance of our light. Being conscious of the darkness in the world fuels our desire to bring more light. Consciousness inspires us to speak up when it's necessary and devote our prayers to those who need them most. Consciousness connects us to all the souls throughout the world who do not have the privilege we may have. Consciousness reminds us to be grateful, joyful, and kind. Without consciousness, it's easy to get caught up in the littleness of our lives. The insane and ridiculous stories we make up and the silly problems we focus on. If you do identify in any way with being apathetic or unconscious, forgive yourself immediately. Remember that in an instant you can dissolve the patterns of your past and step into the power of this present moment. Right now, make the commitment to shift your focus from your littleness and onto the world around you. Take time each day to pay attention to what's happening in the world and devote your loving thoughts and prayers to those who need you most. Step 2. Remember where your true power lies. Be mindful of the power you call on to create change. Are you an angry peace activist or a light worker? Know the difference. Become conscious of how you may use fear as power and separation as a weapon. When we become more conscious of what's happening in the world, it's easy to get scared and angry, much like what happened when I got so fiercely outraged by the gun violence in my country. It's okay to get mad, and it's natural to rage, but remember that anger is not where your true power lies. The key to our power is our capacity to lead from a place of love. So feel the anger and share your outrage with a friend. Honor your anger and fear as great teachers on the path back to peace. Then, as quickly as possible, return to love. Reconnect to your power through prayer. Here's a prayer you can use when you need to access your true power. I recognize my anger and I honor my reaction to the darkness. I know my power lies in my capacity to be the light. I call on the energy and thoughts of love to pour through me and inspire me to take action from a place of true power. Accept your role as a spiritual activist who shows up for the fears of the world with love. Lead from a place of forgiveness and compassion. Know that you can speak up, rise up, and show up with grace. You have the power to dissolve all boundaries with love. Step 3. The peace of love is shining in you now. Lesson 188 from A Course in Miracles says, Why wait for heaven? Those who seek the light are merely covering their eyes. The light is in them now. Enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. Do you think you need to change your circumstances to change your life? All you need to do is change your mind and remember love. Accept the love within you and you'll light up the world. Believe in this light no matter what. Your conviction and certainty help others remember their own. Your remembrance alone has the power to heal. Accept the love that shines through you now. Declare your commitment to live in the light. Honor the wounds that got you here. The Sufi poet Rumi said, The wound is the place where the light enters you. Trust that your wounds are exactly as the universe planned. They were divinely placed in your life in the perfect order so that you could show up for them with love and remember the light within. 
As difficult as your circumstances may have been, take a moment to honor them now. Honor the trauma, honor the pain, and honor the fear, knowing that all along the peace of love was always shining through you. No matter what happens to you in this lifetime, this truth will never change. The peace of love will never leave you. When the fears of the world take you out, return to the present moment and remember that the peace of love still shines in you now. Gently witness the stories and fearful thoughts as distractions from this truth. In the present moment, you can return to love and be at peace. In the present moment, you can restore your connection to the universe and release yourself from all suffering. Step four, become an instrument for love. There is no greater experience than allowing the presence of love to move through you. As you heal your own life through your connection to love, you will be guided to help others do the same. Sometimes the guidance will lead you in directions you never could have imagined. The direction may not always seem logical, but the call will be undeniable. Throughout my life, I've witnessed many transformational leaders follow that undeniable call. One example is Oprah Winfrey. I had the privilege of being invited to a screening of Oprah's own series, Belief. The show featured stunning stories about religious and spiritual practices from around the world, and each story evidenced the power of the universal energy of love. The stories released all religious and spiritual separation and presented us with a vision of what true oneness is. At the screening, Oprah shared the story behind why she created Belief. She said that in her prayers, she asked God to use her for the highest good, and the response she received was to create this series. She put her own money, time, and energy into creating it. At the end of her speech, she teared up as she shared her gratitude with allowing the universal energy of love to work through her in the creation of something so transformational. We all have the capacity to allow the universal energy of love to use us for the highest good. That is why we are here to remember love and to allow it to move through us, heal us, and inspire us to serve. When we surrender to this commitment, we can truly co-create with the universe. We can create movements far beyond our logical mind's capacity to see. We can help others heal and serve people all over the world. The simple act of asking, how would you use me, opens the floodgates for love to transcend all doubt and limitation. Your fear cannot coexist in the presence of this love. That is the final step of this book. Become an instrument for the love of the universe. Begin each day with this simple prayer. How would you use me? Then step back and allow. Let love direct your life. The Course says, You are at peace, and you bring peace with you wherever you are. Allowing the universe to guide you, heal you, and direct you brings peace back into your consciousness. Peace and love can never be lost. When you lead your life with grace and love, you begin to feel a swell of energy move through you. You're given words when you don't have them. You're given strength when you are down. You're given synchronicity and support when you feel lost. You're given safety when you're uncertain. As I conclude this book, I am days away from celebrating 10 years of sober recovery. This anniversary marks the day that I remembered love, the day that I surrendered to the universe for help. I am in awe of the gifts I have received as a result of allowing the universe to be my guide. I am in awe of how I allowed love to work through me. I am in awe of the transformation I have undergone. I am deeply moved by the support, love, and guidance I have grown to rely on. Most important, I am proud of my willingness to heal the world through love. I think about where I was 10 years ago, 25 years old, strung out on drugs and severely insecure. I was a girl who lived in fear, doubt, and uncertainty. Today I am a woman who lives in the light. My transformation is yours. It's available to you now. All you have to do is choose love, spread light, and know that the universe has your back. There are many incredible people who helped me bring this book to life. My literary mentor, guide, and agent, Michelle Martin, who's been on this journey with me from the very beginning. I am deeply grateful for my powerhouse publishers at Hay House, Reed Tracy, Patty Gift, Rochelle Fredson, Michelle Pilly, Leon Naxon, Louise Hay, and the entire Hay House family. 
Thank you, Katie Carlson. You are far more than my editor. You are my dear friend. A huge shout out to my husband, Zach. Hollywood, you are my forever plus one.